So I want to welcome everyone to our second uh, open meeting of the Standing Committee on Offshore Wind Energy and Fisheries. I am Jim Sankirko. I'll introduce myself uh, when we go through the whole committee, but I will hand it over now to Caroline, who's going to give us some introductory remarks. Welcome everybody um, and, and thank you, Jim. Uh, my name is Caroline Bell. I am the study director um, for the standing committee. Um, I'm with the National Academies of Science and the Ocean Studies Board. Um, as we start the meeting, I just wanted to go through a few expectations for conduct. Um, here at the academies, we're committed to fostering a professional, respectful, and inclusive environment where all can participate fully in a harassment-free and discrimination-free atmosphere. We look to each and every one of you to help us maintain a professional and cordial environment. Details on the academy's policy on preventing discrimination, harassment, and bullying are available on the website that it, you can see here on the slide. And for a bit of background, the National Academies is a non-governmental, non-profit organization that's the nation's premier source of expert, evidence-based, and objective advice on science, engineering, and health matters. The National Academies provides independent and objective advice to inform policy in a few different um, ways. The group that we have formed um, here for the meeting today and tomorrow is a standing committee of the National Academies. Um, as I mentioned, it's one of um, many types of activities the National Academy convenes. Others are studies, workshops. Um, the the content, consensus study is a continuing activity designed to provide, provide advice to a sponsor. In our case, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management for BOM on a specific or core topic. And our charge for the standing committee is looking at offshore wind energy and fisheries. Committee members will provide individual advice based on their personal backgrounds, experience and expertise, um, rather than come to a group um, defined consensus and a, a, on recommendations in a written report as our consensus studies do, if you're familiar with National Academies activities. Committee members were selected by the National Academy staff based on nominations received by the public, other National Academies members, board members, sponsors, and other partners. During the call for nominations process, the National Academies uh, sought out uh, nominations with, of personnel with specific areas of expertise. Um, and this was based on the statement of task and the work plan that was designed uh, for this committee. Um, staff, myself, and others conducted interviews and selected potential committee members to fill in needed expertise for the committee. In addition to looking for committee members with um, expertise in areas uh, such as commercial and recreational fishing, fisheries and resource management, social sciences, offshore wind energy industry, state and local and tribal interests, uh, marine and ocean engineering, and marine policy. Committee members were also chosen based on their knowledge of all of the U.S. large marine ecosystems. So we have representation from committee members throughout the United States. Committee members will serve on a rotational basis. Uh, and as this committee is newly formed, additional committee members will be added to bring us up to a full complement of 15 over the next first few years. Um, looking at both what additional expertise can be added based on uh, top meeting topics and also um, to um, make sure that we have representation from um, a diverse background and uh, all regions of the country. Another important part of the selection process is to um, draw upon members that have a broad background and um, year and experience because we are a committee of at this point 12 eventually will be 15 that um, is looking at offshore wind energy and fisheries throughout the entire United States a large area so members were were partly chosen for not necessarily representing one specific 
um, fishery or one specific region, but having understanding of a more broad background and range of experience and expertise. So now um, I will turn it back over to our chair who, and we will introduce the committee and give everyone uh, in the committee some time to introduce themselves. Sure. And uh, just like I didn't do, please remember to turn on your mic uh, when you introduce yourself. And uh, let's try to take a minute or so uh, for each of us. So I will start and hopefully I'll do that. I'll stick with it a minute. My name is Jim Sankirico. I am a professor at the University of California at Davis. I work at the interface of ecology, economics and policy. I'm a natural resource economist by trade. I've done a fair amount of work uh, evaluating fishery management policies around the world. And I feel, and I, I should also mention, I am a member of the Ocean Studies Board uh, here at the Academy and also a member, I can't remember the full title, the US Committee of the UN Ocean Decade for Sustainable, sustainable, sustainable Development. Thank you very much. All right, so what we'll do is we'll just go down uh, alphabetically down the list. Right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Doolittle. My, I um, am the environmental services manager for the Americas region for uh, an offshore geodata company called Fugro. We've worked on 100% of all of the offshore wind farm developments in some capacity here in the United States, and about 50 to 60% of offshore wind farms globally. So in my role here, I will be bringing quite a bit of in industry experience uh, to the committee. What we typically do is we, uh, we map the seafloor for uh, essential fish habitat and also benthic communities. So and our, our data goes into construction and operation plans uh, that are submitted and reviewed by BOEM. So uh, I also, as far as a background, I have training in marine uh, fisheries science. I used to manage the commercial salmon fishery in Alaska and also have worked with the national um, uh, the Northeast Fisheries Science Center and the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, looking at closed area challenges and questions in science uh, for the offshore scallop industry. So, next. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Janet Duffy Anderson. Uh, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Um, I have expertise in anthropogenic effects on fisheries and ecosystems, ecosystem functioning. Um, my background is in all sorts of anthropogenic effects, over water structures, climate, shore zone modification, uh, fishing, and sort of um, cascading effects uh, on ecosystem functioning and fisheries outcomes. I've done work in uh, all of, almost all of the United States large marine ecosystems, New England, Middle Atlantic, Gulf of Mexico, California current system. And I spent 20 years working in the large marine ecosystems in Alaska uh, in my previous position uh, as um, program manager of the ecosystems department at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, NOAA Fisheries. And, and Trisha, can you follow Janet's lead and turn your camera on so the people online can see? Perfect. Um. Okay, I have it on. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Trisha Yadley. I am the Offshore Wind Policy Manager for the Nature Conservancy. I am um, an attorney by background. I have practiced environmental administrative law and federal appellate um, environmental law for more than 25 years. Um, I live in Rhode Island, where I've lived all my life. Um, I formally, just by way of background, uh, I worked with the Rhode Island Attorney General's Office. Uh, my role there was involved, you know, related to a lot of uh, complex environmental litigation at the federal appellate level, rulemaking, challenges to rulemaking. Um, I worked with Conservation Law Foundation in that role. I worked with the state of Rhode Island's Coastal Resource Management Agency as they developed the first ocean special area management plan that was later used to inform where we would site offshore wind off the coast of Rhode Island 
and was very involved in the um, siting of the Block Island Wind Project and the development of the in, um, enforceable policies that are listed in the state's uh, coastal resources management plan. Um, I spent some time in private practice where I represented the state's um, Rhode Island commercial fishing industry, in particular, the Fishermen's Advisory Board um, in complex negotiations with Vineyard Wind for compensation um, pursuant to that ocean special area management plan. Uh, and then before coming to the Nature Conservancy, I went back to serve as the chief of the energy and environment unit at the Rhode Island Attorney General's office. Um, with the Nature Conservant, the Nature Conservancy is a global nonprofit environmental organization. We work in all 50 uh, states and in 77 countries around the world. And the focus of the organization is um, developing de decision support tools and um, tools that enable science to be integrated into decision making so that we get um, decisions that are informed by the best available science. And I think it's Stephen. Thank you. Um, my name is Steve Joner. I'm from Port Angeles, Washington. I'm a fishery biologist working with the Makai Indian tribe uh, in Northwest Washington. I've been with the tribe for well over 40 years. Um, the tribe is very active in fishing in the ocean. They are one of uh, 24 treaty tribes in the Northwest, 20 in Northwest Washington and four on the Columbia River. And we uh, work through the Pacific, Pacific Fishery Management Council uh, to develop uh, fishing uh, regulations and, and allocations to the tribes for all fish that are managed in the EEZ by the Pacific Council and Department of Commerce. Uh, throughout my career, I've been very active in developing and managing the tribe's fisheries. I also work with uh, the other tribes in Washington, Oregon, and California. Um, I've been very active in the Pacific Fishery Management Council process throughout my career. Currently, I'm on the ground fish advisory panel and the council's um, uh, marine planning committee. Um, I'm also active uh, in uh, managing the Pacific Whiting uh, on a commission with the Canadians. So I've been uh, quite involved with dealing with BOEM since they showed up on the West Coast. And we're very concerned about the cumulative impacts that offshore wind development will have on the resources that these tribes depend on. Not only the macaws and the other tribes that fish in the ocean, but tribes, uh, including all the way up the Columbia River that are dependent on salmon that are produced in the ocean. So uh, you'll, you'll hear me talking about the, the impacts of, of harvesting this wind energy and, and the impacts that are unknown at this point on uh, the various resources. So that's that's going to be my prime of primary focus. Um, but I also believe I'm speaking for a number of the fisheries on the West Coast because of my involvement through the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Eric, are you up online? Yep. Hi, everyone. Eric Kingma. I'm the executive director of the Hawaii Longline Association. Um, we're a major fishery of the United States. We have about 150 vessels operating out of Hawaii, uh, certainly Hawaii's largest commercial fishery, um, largest producer of swordfish and tuna uh, fresh in the United States domestically. Um, I got about 20 years experience in fisheries management um, the last four or five years here on the sort of private sector commercial fishing side. Uh, before that, uh, involved in the Western Pacific Fishery Management Council. Um, I believe I have a pretty good handle on the NOAA uh, fishery service and the council management process, as well as the requirements for consistency with other applicable law, like the Marine Mammal Protection Act, ESA, NEPA, etc. I have to admit I have less experience with BOEM, so um, you know, hopefully I'll uh, learn quickly about their process and be able to advise uh, really from the fishery impact side of things, commercial fishing, as well as here in the Pacific, you know, we have a lot of our Pacific islands, we have a lot of um, uh, kind of quasi-commercial weekend warrior 
subsistence fishermen that are really important to the sort of fabric of the community. Um, and so, yeah, happy to be on the committee. Thanks. I'm Captain Dan Kipnis. I live in West Palm Beach, Florida, formerly of Miami Beach, Florida. Um, I had uh, party fishing boats, drift boats, a fleet, uh, the reward fishing fleet. Um, my expertise, besides uh, I'm 73 years old, I started working on the boats when I was 10 years old. So I've been around a long time. Um, I commercial fished, I had a fish market, um, recreational fish, and I was a former Marine State of Florida Marine Fisheries Commissioner, so I'm familiar with how fisheries rules are made. I sat on a committee for the South Atlantic Council. Um, I've been involved in fisheries management for many, many years um, as a layperson, but I guess if you do it long enough, it's like going to graduate school. You get a degree of hard knocks, and so I'm here to uh, lend my expertise to this very difficult uh, but very, very important question of renewable energy at sea and uh, how we can help our users, the resource, and the earth all at the same time come out of this win-win. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Maxwell. I'm an associate professor at University of Washington on the Bothell campus, which is about 20 minutes from uh, uh, from Seattle. Um, my expertise is largely in animal movement, um, as well as fisheries. Um, my background is um, using a lot of telemetry devices to understand where animals go, and then particularly looking at um, sustainable, sustainable human practices in order to sort of decouple those things. So that's kind of the the way that I've approached um, a lot of questions, including around fisheries, um, particularly with things like dynamic ocean management um, and um, to a lesser degree, mobile marine protected areas. Uh, more recently, I've been working a bit in the wind space, um, particularly looking at um, environmental impacts kind of across the board from wind, um, particularly floating offshore wind turbines. And we recently published a paper on that uh, last year, kind of trying to look at some of the more overall overarching um, environmental impacts um, to a large number of species, um, as well as uh, fish. That's it. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Steven Cyphers. Uh, I'm an associate professor at the University of South Alabama in the School of Marine and Environmental Sciences and also uh, in sociology. My lab's research is, is across those two domains. We largely work on environmental sociology and, and ecology issues. Um, we're particularly focused on human dimensions of fisheries and a lot of the projects that we work on uh, focus on things like social impacts or outcomes of environmental change or management actions on individual fishermen and fishing communities. Um, I'm active in fisheries management, largely in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm on the Gulf Council's Standing Scientific and Statistical Committee, the SSC, uh, and also the Ecosystem Technical Committee, the ETC. Uh, and this is my third National Academies Committee. I'm also currently serving on the Committee on uh, Equity in the Distribution of Fisheries Benefits and I previously served on one on uh, catch limits um, in recreational fisheries in the Gulf. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ronald Smolowitz. I'm a technical advisor to the sea scallop industry here on the East Coast. Um, my degree is in marine engineering and naval architecture. I served for 20 years as a NOAA commissioned officer. I have 10 years at sea on survey and fisheries research vessels off the East Coast, off Alaska, and throughout the Pacific, the South Pacific, uh, right up to uh, South America. Um, since I retired, I've been uh, doing fishing gear research and surveys in the Northeast. Thank you. So my name is David Wallace. I uh, represent the uh, Surf Clam and Ocean Cog uh, fishery in the Northeast uh, Atlantic, or the Northwest Atlantic. Um, 
I've been doing that since the before there was the Magnuson Stevens Act, and the the government had the opportunity to start managing the fisheries initially, uh, not as sustainably as necessary, but ultimately to sustain all fisheries to the best of ability of um, the federal government. I have um, been involved in all kinds of um, different uh, portions of the industry from uh, being a, a, a member of the Surf Clam Motion Cog Management uh, Committee, uh, uh, advisory committee for, um, you know, 40 years. And um, on when the Magnuson Act was re uh, uh, authorized, they put in the uh, uh, social uh, assist the habitat amendment. And so I then was on the uh, Mid Atlantic Council's and the New England Council's habitat committee, which we have then gotten to the point where everything is dependent on the impact or the association between fisheries and the and the uh, the uh, fi central a uh, central fish habitat which has uh, greatly expanded and i would say complicated the situation uh, with the new challenge is wind turbines uh, placing in about uh, 5,000 square miles, 2,000 um, wind turbines, uh, taking up like 2,000 miles of that is going to have enormous negative impacts on uh, fisheries, in particular shell fisheries, which cannot move. Uh, so the impacts are going to be very, very uh, severe if something is not understood and done. And uh, the cumulative impacts of all of this, uh, both on the air, the, the sea, and the tides, and all of those other things with these uh, fixed uh, turbine foundations that are sometimes in the future will be up to 50 feet in diameter. They're just enormous structures that are um, a thousand feet tall um, and are going to have just unbelievable negative impacts on the environment and on fisheries. And so I'm here to help find solutions so that we can minimize the uh, negative impacts. Dick, are you still online? Oh, ah, there you are. Um, yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dick Yu. Uh, I'm the uh, Philip J. Solons Chair Professor of Engineering at MIT. I'm also a professor of um, mechanical and ocean engineering in the School of Engineering at MIT. Uh, I've been a professor at MIT for over 40 years. Uh, MIT has a joint um, education and research program with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Uh, I have been a joint program professor for over 30 years. Um, for approximately 10 years, or just a little bit over 10 years, I was also the uh, associate dean, the number two person uh, in the School of Engineering at MIT. Uh, I'm a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, all my uh, academic degrees are from MIT, uh, bachelor's, master's, uh, PhD and Doctor of Science degrees. Um, uh, my degrees are in civil environmental engineering, uh, coastal and uh, ocean wave hydrodynamics. Uh, I'm an expert on um, the uh, ocean engineering, uh, coastal engineering, offshore engineering. Uh, I study the environment of the uh, offshore or coastal uh, environment. Uh, wave current interactions, wave wave interactions. Uh, I also have done a lot of research on um, ocean engineering of offshore structures, um, 
wave structure interactions and the impact of uh, the environment on the structures and the environment of impact of the structures on the environment, of course. Um, I have uh, active research on uh, fundamental, uh, fundamental aspects of uh, uh, ocean wave energy uh, uh, resources. Uh, I have also uh, looked at uh, synergistic developments of wave and uh, wind offshore uh, resources. Uh, I have also studied a lot of the hydrodynamics of fish, uh, fish schooling, fish sensing. Uh, I have currently active projects on understanding the, the hydrodynamics of uh, aquaculture, fish farming, and environmental impact of the same. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, serve on this committee uh, and bring my expertise to, to, uh, to be available to the committee. Um, now, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> we'll go through staff briefly. Um, I introduced myself um, very briefly before, as I mentioned, I'm Caroline Bell, Associate Program Officer with Ocean Studies Board. Um, prior to coming to the National Academies, I was a Coast Guard officer for 15 years. Um, I've been at the National Academies about nine months now. I'm really happy to um, join the Ocean Studies Board and help lead this standing committee as um, it kicks off and uh, tackles this very important task. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Susan Roberts. I'm the director of the Ocean Studies Board, and I have um, background in a PhD in marine biology. I actually did my PhD on fish, but I've been with the, with the Ocean Studies Board now for almost 25 years. So I now consider myself an SMG, which is a subject matter generalist. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm really pleased to, to have this group with us today. And then I'll ask Safa to uh, wave a hand in front of the camera over here. <laughs> Safa's our, our program assistant um, working on this project who's um, behind all of the logistics. So thank you very much, Safa, for running everything so smoothly for us. <laughs> we will also have um, another OSB uh, staff member, Stacy. I'll let you jump on. Stacy Karras, I'm a senior program officer with the Ocean Studies Board as well. I'm um, the study director or the project director for our other standing committee with BOEM, the Committee on Offshore Science and Assessment. So sitting in to uh, just to listen today and to understand how our two committees can work uh, collaboratively and cooperatively without stepping on each other's toes. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Stacy. And thank you for explaining what COSA actually means. <laughs> I can never remember the acronym. <laughs> Moving on, um, on the, the slides now, you'll see this is the statement of task for um, the standing committee. Um, it kind of lays out three broad areas of um, activity for the standing committee to engage in. Um, it, is, it is a bit broader than some of our other activities that are narrowly focused, but given that we are a standing committee and we are looking at a huge um, topic area, uh, the, the standing committee kind of reflects that this and gives us the flexibility in the committee to um, pursue a variety of topics in future meetings. For um, those in, that are joining us from the public, how to stay, stay informed about this um, standing committee's meetings. There's a few different um, ways here that you can see on the slide. Um, the first uh, link on the, on the slide is Take, we'll take you directly to the standing committee's um, information page where there will be updates about events. Um, it lists all of our committee members and their bios. It also links lists the statement of task for the standing committee. Um, and then if you follow the link, the general OSB link, um, the lower one on the slide, uh, that will allow you to sign up to subscribe to OSB updates. Uh, the, the, 
email list with, is where announcements about future meetings will be sent. Um, and then also the, you can see on circled in red on the right side of the screen is a link um, from the main OSB page to the standing committee um, page. And briefly, I'll run through the meeting uh, agenda for today and tomorrow. Uh, <clears throat> we're coming to the close of the welcome and introduction to the standing committee. Um, then we'll shift to hear more specifically about some of the goals that BOEM has for this standing committee uh, and then move into um, discussions from BOEM's uh, four regional, four regions um, and time for questions following their presentations and then a larger um, Q&A period for discussions with regional reps. Tomorrow, uh, we'll start off with a presentation by Mr. Steve Joner um, on the treaty tribes and their relationship to fisheries management process. Then we'll receive an overview of BOEM's environmental programs with time for question and answer. Uh, and then there's an open period here from 4 to 4.45 p.m. Eastern tomorrow, um, looking at future meeting topics. The committee will present a few topics that we have been discussing in closed session for future meetings, but this is also a chance for the public to um, let us know if there are topics um, that are of interest to you all as stakeholders, as, as public, in, public members, um, so the, this portion, we will take some time to um, either through the, the Q&A feature chat or hand raising to hear from members of the public um, that are on the, the Zoom meeting uh, about topic future meeting topics. These will, we ask that you are address your comments to the committee members, because this is time for the committee to gather information about how we should um, proceed moving forward. What are some important uh, uh, issues that uh, the public uh, feels this committee can address. And then finally, before we go into the first presentation, um, just ask that um, participants um, and panelists mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, raise the hand feature, use the chat, or there's also a Q&A feature that um, uh, members of the the panelists, members of the committee can see um, questions and can answer questions as the meeting goes on. So please, um, for the members of the audience, if you have direct questions, you can uh, put them in the Q&A feature of the Zoom as well. And for committee members and, and panelists in the room, um, we ask that you keep your camera on to the greatest extent possible to um, have a support a sense of community. This is a hybrid meeting and we do have people in room and virtually. So we want to try to make it as inclusive as possible for everyone. All right. And with that, um, we will pull up the slides for our first pres presentation from Brian Hooker um, from BOEM on the review of BOEM's goals uh, for standing committee um, and some time for the committee to ask clarifying questions. Great, thank you, uh, Caroline, and thank you to the committee for um, being here uh, in person and uh, and online uh, for those that are here uh, or those that are, are virtual. Um, uh, you know, last week um, we had our our sponsor briefing, or not last week? I guess it was two weeks ago. We had our sponsor briefing, and you know, you heard from uh, Director Klein and. Um, uh, Bill Brown, as well as Karen Baker, who's uh, the chief of the of the Office of Renewable Energy Programs, who's seated right here at my uh, right. And just again, to really uh, try to get across to the committee the importance we think at BOEM of, of the committee and the input that we hope to give. And after hearing you know all that expertise going around the room, I, I feel confident that uh, we'll be able to, to get that feedback. Um, next slide. So this, uh, so Karen did uh, present this slide uh, two weeks ago to you, but I thought it was uh, good to just touch upon it um, really quickly one more time in the context of uh, the goals for for this committee. And if you could just do two more clicks, I think there's two circles that will pop up. So we have, you know, built into our process formal steps, you know, to engage 
um, the public and fisheries constituents as we move through the process. Uh, for example, just I think today, the call for information and nominations for the Gulf of Maine uh, was published in the Federal Register. And that's kind of on this left hand side in the planning and analysis of, you know, very specific points where we engage the public and ask for uh, ask for comments. Um, and then in the Atlantic, which we'll hear from later today, we're doing a lot on the far right of, of this rainbow graphic on the construction and operations side, where we're doing environmental reviews for construction and operations plans um, for specific projects that are being proposed. I, I raise it here because, you know, I think in addition to these, you know, real formal touch points along the planning timeline, um, you know, BOEM also has endeavored to engage with fisheries um, you know, whether or not we're doing a, uh, we have a studies development plan, and sometimes we have workshops um, and, and meetings through that studies development plan. We've actually done some other um, prioritiz fisheries prioritization um, uh, meetings with the National Academies in the past. Um, and so that's a way to engage uh, the public as well. And this occurs in, in all of Bohm's regions. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, we engage regularly with the fisheries management councils and, and commissions. Um, you know, I think the point there is that that's a great forum. People are already gathered, people who are interested in BOEM's process to be able to engage and give updates and receive feedback directly. However, we've always, you know, recognized that the councils and commissions, their primary goal is fisheries management, not offshore energy management. So we've struggled um, with, you know, is, is there other avenues um, to which we can engage, um, you, know, you know, fisheries constituents? Um, and, and as we recognize some, not all of them may be rec represented um, in those fishery management councils or commissions. Um, but it, and that leads me to the other engagement slide, uh, piece in our next slide. So for, you know, from the beginning, we have uh, these intergovernmental renewable energy task forces. Uh, these are requested uh, by governors. Um, they consist of representatives from federally recognized tribes, federal agencies, states, and local governments, and serve as forums to coordinate planning, feedback, and educate on Bowman's process, permitting, statutory requirements, et cetera. Uh, the last bullet point here is that while they're they're open to the public, task force membership is limited to government representatives. And so that has been something that has been raised uh, throughout our process is like, well, wouldn't it be great if there was, you know, a more formal mechanism to engage um, with fisheries constituents? Um, and, and going back way in our in our BOEM MMS, you know, history, there um, actually was a, a federal advisory committee um called the regional technical working group um for for fisheries and some here may may even recall that or were were part of those um but for a variety of reasons the federal government has moved away from a lot of the the federal advisory committees that i think have been established uh throughout time so um you know what we were been trying to do since then is like well what is the best avenue to engage and even, you know, when developing the statement of tasks for this committee, you know, we struggled, you know, should this be a national committee? Should this be a regional committee? You know, should it be just fishermen or should it be, um, you know, a variety of expertise, um, you know, that can really help inform BOEM? And obviously, where it's clear where we landed on that. Um, but in the statement of tasks, I think we did, you know, try to make it, you know, pretty broad that um, that we wanted to hear from the direction of the committee on things and not really be prescriptive about, you know, these are the exact things we want to hear from you about. And um, and and Karen Baker and Liz, I think both uh, made that really clear in the um, the sponsors meeting uh, two weeks ago. <clears throat> um, let's see anything else on this. Anyway, so I think, you know, we, we do, we re are really optimistic that, um, you know, we're always, you know, interested in finding constructive solutions that will allow fishing and offshore wind to successfully coexist. Um, we believe that it should be done in a public way. And obviously, I think we've had you know good public participation in these, <laughs> just the uh, one and a half meetings we've had with this one. Um, and an open and transparent process with measurable progress and solutions. And we, we are hopeful and uh, that 
um, the standing committee uh, will be able to provide that uh, valuable input to, to BOEM. So next slide, please. So the, you know, why we left that statement of task, you know, pretty, pretty wide open. One of the things that, you know, I know we've talked about as staff is, you know, what exactly did we mean and in, in, in some of those things. And so I think we were asked to, you know, try to identify some of these buckets a little bit more, um, or categories, excuse me, more discreetly. Um, so I think, you know, what I've put on here is one of the things that, you know, you'll hear, I think, later on in the, the, the regions where we are in different regions, all at different stages in that rainbow graphic. Um, and I think all regions still, no matter where we are in the process, always, you know, seem to struggle to find effective communication. Fisheries uh, groups are such a diverse uh, group of constituents. And we're always open for um, identification of effective uh, communication strategies. So that's that was always identified as one way. The committee itself, I think, is one of those ways to improve that communication. Um, another one that was, I think, even more explicit in the statement of task is around uh, research, um, the identification, development of, of a coordinated you know, research plan. I did put an, a graphic on this slide that we BOEM does currently have a studies development plan that we update every year and that we solicit input on um, every year. But you know that that's kind of done at a broad broad level. You know we try to make the councils aware when we're we're doing council briefings, but there may not be that opportunity to directly engage, saying, "Hey, you know the studies development plan solicitation, you know, is starting today and will be open for the next uh, you know two months." So. Um, it's an opportunity again for us to be able to really engage more real time, um, you know, with uh, with representatives um, of, of various aspects of fish and fisheries. the The last one on on here is you know providing feedback on issues that um, that Bone provides guidance on. So, uh, one that I think is is recent and on a lot of people's minds is uh, Bone's. Um, you know, fisheries mitigation uh, guidance. Uh, that's just you know one one example that um, that we're currently working on. Um, again, best practices for developers outreach. So again, at the top of there is Bones outreach, but um, we've also have been really striving in recent uh, sales or uh, lease auctions in the um, in the uh, lease conditions to provide you know a feedback loop so that you know that there's a direct communication uh, between lessees and fisheries constituents early in the process that's something that we've always been told oh it's too late by the time a plan gets submitted to boehm and boehm's you know boehm starts its public engagement process the plan is already submitted um so that's another area where we've tried to improve upon uh but again it could be an area where we we get some additional feedback from from this group um, and then lastly, this one has been uh, something that, you know, was raised early on. It may it may or may not still be a, an issue, but uh, what the role of fisheries liaisons and, and representatives are, who are they, you know, um, you know, what is their, what should their role be and how do they, are there best practices around, you know, those relationships and how that communication again occurs between uh, the lessee and, um, and fishing communities. So again, this is uh, just you know just an idea of of different examples where you know we see the committee providing um, you know feedback to BOEM, um, but again, if, if the committee may come up with more or uh, even you know refined uh, ideas based on on these uh, categories here, but um, yeah, that that's really it for the um, the slides I have uh, on that topic. So happy to turn it over to questions. I, maybe I'll ask Karen if she has anything she wants to add. I'll push, I was actually pushing this sign. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I just wanted to reiterate what, what Brian said. I think we're, we're very much interested in, in being less prescriptive and more hearing uh, from the assembled expertise here. I, I, just want to say thank you again. We are, uh, as I was listening and we were talking around the room, I'm just very 
humbled by all the expertise and experience you all bring to the table and knowledge. And we're looking to learn from that and uh, where we can help and answer questions and shape. That's great. But I think where we're, we are, as Brian said, uh, more interested in hearing about topics that you you feel Boehm should know about and, and be exploring than we are being prescriptive in this arena. Yeah, so, well, so we could open this up now. Questions from the, the committee. So Steve. Okay, um, i get my camera on here. Is it on? There we go. So um, this morning uh, and, or earlier today, we, we had a conversation about uh, Boehm's limited enforcement after the leases and that it, it's turned over to Bessie, the Bureau of, we got, Check my notes. <laughs> yeah, it's a new one on me. So, uh, as somebody involved with federal fisheries management, uh, as far as ocean fisheries regulation uh, go, it's it's one stop shopping with the National Marine Fisheries Service. Likewise, with Fish and Life Service for inland fisheries and and birds and so on. So, this is something new. Uh, dealing with an agency that is going to do their thing and then move on. So uh, I'm quite frankly lost how, how we deal with that in a, in a way that's really satisfactory. Uh, I know not just the tribes, but everybody who relies on the ocean. So where, where do they fit in? And how do we bring that into our discussion here? Because I, I think that's gonna be very, very critical to dealing with the concerns that many of us have here. Sure, I can take a, you know, um, you know, certainly we can, uh, if, if the committee so desires, we could have uh, Bessie, uh, Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, come for a, a session to talk about the, the relationship we have. It's a very close relationship, as you know, that we used to be one agency under the Marine, Marine Minerals Service. Um, and so that the relationship continues to be very strong. Um, and we work with them. We're in the same building. <laughs> well, for those of us who are still in person. In the same building, and um, you know, have you know, work with them on on a regular basis in the interpretation of our enforceable conditions that we put in the the construction and operations plans. So ultimately, that's where you know they will come into play. Is you know, reviewing, understanding what those uh, uh, enforceable conditions of their construction and operations plans are, um, and you know, again, if there's any question there, they know who to contact if they have any issue or understanding what uh, the conditions are or what they were meant to do. Um, you know, we're always, always there to be able to, to respond to those inquiries. But, um, you know, I, again, I think the, the idea why it was uh, split apart is um, the, they wanted to clearly, def, you know, separate the, the kind of the management leasing aspect from uh, the enforcement to, for it to be again, independent of, um, of the management, um, you know, leasing process. Um, so uh, it's it's still, um, you know, still uh, occurring. It, the the regulation splitting the, re the the regulation that split the regulations was uh, only just published uh, what a couple months ago now, right? Um, but I don't know if Karen wants to add any more about the split. I just say that we're we're working very closely in partnership, as Brian said, and we we work very hard to. Uh, ensure that we're as seamless as we possibly can, especially across that, that uh, those, those, those operations and then moving into, of course, into the enforcement uh, that Bessie takes over. And uh, one, you know, multi, two bureaus, but one department. And as I said, we, we are really, we literally, I'm, I'm a hallway away from um, my partner in renewable energy and Bessie. And so I think that we are working really hard to try to, to keep that as seamless as we possibly can. Uh, and and again, would welcome input on how we can do that as best we can. So I guess I'd like to say that that's a topic I would very much like to discuss. Sure, I was jotting that down. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Janet Duffy Anderson. Um, I'm curious if you could just describe a little bit of Bohm's 
mission and sort of tasking with respect to offshore wind and, and maybe just a little bit of clarification and a deeper dive of whether or not that differs with uh, respect to the different regions that you're you're operating in. That's a great question. So so BOEM's mission is to oversee the economically and environmentally responsible uh, development of energy across over in the outer continental shelf. And our main authority comes from OXLA, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. Thank you. I always make sure that when you say the acronym so often, I want to make sure I state that correctly. Uh, and largely our history really comes from into uh, marine minerals and, and, and oil and gas. Uh, the Energy Policy Act 2005 introduced uh, renewable energy and then and, and thus offshore wind. And uh, well, it doesn't necessarily, I would say, differ. I would say that our focus, of course, has been uh, in in recent years, as Brian indicated, in in the Atlantic. That was where really the most ideal wind was determined to be, and where you know, we, we've had the most development thus far. My office, uh, I am the office of renew, the chair of the chief of the office of renewable energy P program. So I oversee the national program, but I'm sort of dual hatted in that um, my team that's that's located with with us here in in on, in the the DC area is is focused on the Atlantic operations, and we are really taking everything that we have in terms of our lessons learned and applying it and sharing it with the regions. So we've got a bit of an oversight and policy aspect as well as we're very much operational in, in that we are overseeing all the permitting that's happening and leasing and permitting that's happening in, in Atlantic right now. Uh, and so it, that I think that, I hope that helps a little bit. I mean, we, we're, we're, as we said, we're moving into Gulf of Mexico, Pacific and other areas. And my team is serving in, 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 in most respects as, a, as an advisor and sort of a policy uh, advisor and, and, and lessons learned and best practices for, for um, those that are starting to look at that in their other regions. Hi, uh, this is Ron Smolowitz. That last slide you had, Brian, you, you talked about a, uh, a research plan, a comprehensive research plan. Actually, what is that? And uh, especially with each developer has their own, you know, monitoring strategy, and usually they're not compatible with the next development downstream. What is, how is that all interrelated? The coordinated research plan when we don't even have coordinated monitoring. Right. No, I, but I think actually your last point, we don't even have coordinated monitoring. This, I, I struggled with the words on this one, and I think there was like I went back and forth over, uh, you know, how to phrase this. It, you know, I think what we've seen already um, is a lot of work around like the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance and, you know, just more coordination across the board, whether it's, again, uh, the uh, work that BOEM's doing, work that the National Marine Fisheries Service is doing, um, and, or work that the developers are doing as part of their, their monitoring. I think it's just, again, when I, when I put that up there, I think the, the idea is what I see some an entity like the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance or the response, um, the Regional Wildlife Science um, uh, Consortium, um, those types of roles of, of like helping to coordinate. And I didn't, you're right, I, I probably should have put coordinated in there. Um, oh, I did put coordinated. Uh, you know, all the the objectives and research that we're we're trying to achieve rather than, you know potentially piecemeal everybody off, you know, doing everything on their own and not having that coordinated. So that's, it was in that vein of, you know, the, what we, what we collectively, not just Boeing, but collectively uh, across federal government, states and, and developers have been sought to trying to achieve through something like ROSA. But your bullet, it, my question is, are you going to present that to us for comment? No, no, this is just something that you guys, if you, if you wanted to to provide input on how that could be done more effectively or or um, identify things that, you know, again, if you want to be specific that BOEM should fund or that, you know, that, you know, National Marine Fisheries Service or or some other entity could uh, could work on, that's that's what it's meant to to be there is just like not thinking beyond just BOEM should fund this study 
but what what should we be coordinating across uh, the different entities that are out there doing research? Thank you, thank you, Brian, for the presentation. Um, can would you be willing to go back to the process figure that you showed? So, um, I, I was looking at this online, and I came across a different version that actually shows some stakeholder engagement emphasis across the the, the process. And you mentioned that there had been an emphasis on moving stakeholder engagement earlier on. I was just wondering if you could talk about that a little bit more about where the current stakeholder engaged parts are. And specifically, if um, if they're mostly communication outward from BOEM, or if they're also input from stakeholders into the process, and how that kind of you know looks throughout. Sure, I think if you've seen something different online, it, what we've done is sometimes taken like the planning and analysis piece and blown that up. And if you take the planning and analysis piece and blow that up, you will see, I think, a lot more you know from from doing a request for information to now we've recently announced for for uh, uh, several projects that we're doing a draft call for information and nominations and then a final call for information and nominations and each one of those having a public engagement process that's not only Boeing putting it out there but also receiving um, input and and what I was you know, some of that input we've done, um, you know, again, dependent upon, uh, you know, the constituents that we've identified that might be interested in that particular project. Uh, we have done, uh, you know, fishery specific outreach around that. Um, we also have the, the the state federal task forces that um, that I mentioned. And then sometimes, and it's still even in addition to that, there's, um, you know, all along other engagement opportunities like Oh, there's a council meeting coming up, and we just announced this draft uh, call area. This would be a good time to go, you know, give an update to the council and you know receive feedback uh, that way. And those are a little bit more. They're formal. I mean, they're they're documented. Those are recorded by the councils, um, but they're they're not necessarily a a a bo They're not bone led, right? They're we're coming at the um, invitation of of the councils. So um, that's uh, that's what I think. So that circle on the planning analysis size, yes, if you blew that up, you would you would see a lot more pieces in there. Um, and then you know, fast forwarding, you know, again through construction and operations, um, you know that that as well has um, you know opportunities not only from the you know, initial scoping meetings um, that we have for a particular project to the, uh, public hearings on the actual EIS, um, itself. And then uh, oftentimes we, during those public hearings, we try to do targeted outreach. Uh, I, I know we're still, it seems like post COVID still trying to now, you know, do a little bit of mix of hybrid and in-person, you know, pr prior to the, uh, COVID pandemic, you know, it was, it really was, we'd, we'd hit, be on the road for like a week or two and, and hit all the different ports that might be affected. Now it's a combination of in-person and, and, and virtual. So that, that's captured broadly in that, that, that second circle, but there are, you know, several uh, points that each of those circles represents. Yeah, I think I'm going to, take chair prerogative here and ask the last question. So, you know, this is our second meeting and I still feel like we're sort of on a first date trying to feel out each other to understand where we all stand and uh, how we both can be most useful to each other. So when you guys, let's just make the assumption that the contract is renewed out. Uh, so there's, a, you know, three or four more years, five years. Is, when you look back, how would you judge that this was a success from Bohm's point of view? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I think, I think the, you know, from my perspective, the, the, the proof will be in, you know, successful projects, right? I mean, that's eventually, what we're trying to get through is get to as a process by which at the end there is a successful project. Um, 
I, I don't, I'm not naive in thinking that there won't be any, any concerns throughout the, you know, the life of the project or that this, uh, this committee will, will solve everything. But I think it will really help to uh, ensure that we can, um, you know, look back and say, hey, we did everything in our power to try to engage and get feedback on these issues as they arose um, in, you know, throughout, throughout this, you know, planning process. Uh, that's, that's coming from me. I, I don't know if Karen has any other uh, things to add. It's a fantastic question and it's, uh, and it's definitely, I think Brian hit upon it. I think, you know, BOEM is, I think often as we, we work through this process, we're seen as a proponent for the wind industry. Uh, it is, and we do, we are charged with, with advancing the administration's goal of 30 gigawatts by 2030, but we are entrusted with getting it right in terms of the, the permitting in terms of what are the environmental impacts, the impacts to fisheries, the impact we, we, we have to consider all stakeholders, all interests. And, and so uh, the extent to which we make informed and durable, uh, so actually a term our, our director uses a lot is durable decisions, I think, and, and how, how you can help us to shape that and make sure that we are doing that uh, at, in, in a way that again um, incorporates all the, the interests that are represented here, it would be that would be tremendous for us. I think. And you should feel free to ask us that question also <laughs> from our own perspective. <laughs> and we're trying to figure all that out. So we are uh, a couple of minutes late. We're slated to take a fifteen-minute break. And uh, do we have all the speakers in the room or some online? They're, most are online. Brian is speaking yeah. and then the other three are online. Okay. So are we okay to extend it to 320 or do you want to stay at 315 just to stay on time? I think let's stay on three, three, stay at 315. Um, since we just, we just started, I think 10 minutes is, is a good break for everyone. All right, great. Thank you very much. So we'll come back, uh, be ready to start at 3.15. With that, I would like to turn it back over to Brian for <laughs> the, the Atlantic Offshore Wind Program um, presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Caroline. No problem. Um, so I think, you know, the, part of the objective of this, uh, these slides is just to kind of set the context and uh, for all the different regions about where we are. Because I, as I mentioned, the rainbow slide, the rainbow graphic, you know, there's a, a big wide continuum of where we are in different places. So I'm going to try to do it in the Atlantic. There's a lot going on in the Atlantic. Um, I'm you know, happy to, to try to answer any questions. I kind of uh, had the advantage of being speaking in both uh, time slots that I probably won't go into the, the, the fisheries engagement quite as much as you might hear um, in, in the other regions, but uh, because I already touched upon where those touch points were to some extent. Um, but anyway, next slide. So um, so offshore wind, where are we in the Atlantic? I, I did, uh, there was a, I think a, I've been with BOEM over, over 10 years now. And I, I sometimes joke when people say like oh, all the offshore wind, and it's like, I've been here 10 years and we've done two turbines. Um, so, you know, if I take the average of how many turbines we've, we've been doing, it's, it's not very many. So we do have two turbines uh, offshore uh, Virginia that have been spinning um, for, for a couple of years now um, that we've been able to do a lot of uh, studies on um, as well through our, uh, what's termed the, the rodeo project. Um, and Dominion Energy, which operates those, has also been doing uh, some studies out there. Um, but in addition, the, the nation's first um, offshore wind project is in state waters um, uh, off of Block Island. So it's right, uh, right within um, that uh, three-mile limit off, off of Block Island. Um, Boehm had a, a, a kind of a smaller role in the permitting of the uh, the offshore export cable that did go through um, the o OCS waters, Outer Continental Shelf uh, waters. Um, but that's it. That's all we have uh, currently constructed. We actually do have two more const um, under construction. Um, that is the Vineyard Wind One project and the South Fork, South Fork Wind Farm project. Uh, both of those projects are in Southern New England 
and are really just getting kicked off um, this spring and summer. Um, right now, there's no foundation installation occurring yet. It's been just uh, cable installation work that's uh, begun there, um, both uh, inshore and, and offshore. And then we move into the, the big side of things where, where we're, what's keeping us very, very busy right now is the seven projects. I think I counted this right. Karen can correct me if I'm wrong. Seven projects under COP assessment. And so what I mean by under COP assessment is that we've begun like the NEPA and consultation pro process for seven projects. Um, and that's uh, in Southern New England, that's the Revolution Wind, Sunrise, New England Wind, South and South Coast projects. And in the Mid-Atlantic, that's the Ocean Wind One, uh, Seaval Commercial uh, Project and Empire Wind uh, Project. And uh, I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm if I'm mis uh, undercounting, but I think we have, and then we have several more that are very close uh, to, we have a construction operations plan received and we're very close to beginning to initiate uh, that NEPA and consultation phase. Um, so the next slide is uh, just, you know, kind of highlighting where those are. Um, starting uh, in that Southern New England area, you can see that there's uh, several projects uh, and lease areas in that Southern New England area. This is the far, far left panel. And you'll see the us uh, kind of getting credit for the National Grid Sea to Shore Export Cable. That's the National Grid label there. That's the, the export cable to Block Island. So that uh, was under our jurisdiction. Um, what I didn't put in this far left one is the, um, the, the Gulf of Maine call area. Um, I have a slide with a link uh, later on in the presentation that you can do. We just announced, I think just published on the Federal Register today, the, the final call area for the Gulf of Maine. Um, so the middle panel uh, is all the Mid-Atlantic projects. Uh, as you can see, there are several um, uh, lease areas that are just beginning um, the kind of, on, again, on the farther left-hand side of the rainbow graphic process in, in the New York Bight area, and then some are that are um, on the right-hand side of that rainbow graphic um, in, uh, off of New Jersey and uh, in Virginia. And then lastly, uh, we, we, we don't forget about our South Atlantic uh, projects, uh, the Duke Energy and, and Total Energies uh, projects uh, right around the North Carolina, um, South Carolina border. The, it was part of the uh, Carolina Long Bay uh, auction uh, that those two leases uh, came from. And so that's the extent of all the leases there. I guess a, the other, we do have a, um, an area identification, again, far left of rainbow graphic process going on in the Central Atlantic. Um, and I'll touch on that in uh, on the next slide. So next slide. So where are we in the planning and leasing? Again, this is pre-lease activity. I mentioned the Central Atlantic. Um, so we have uh, several draft wind energy areas. Remember, again, I, I mentioned that um, we have uh, some, we can start with as small as a request for information. Um, we've recently been doing these draft wind energy areas and then, a, um, and then we eventually will get to a, a final uh, wind energy area that um, then identifies the, the, lease, the leases that we'll bring to auction. So the draft wind energy areas were published uh, back in November um, and we're utilizing now and, and moving forward um, uh, a, a, uh, um, marine siting tool um, through the NOAA's uh, National Centers for Coastal and Ocean Services and costs. Um, and so that there's a link there for where we are on the, the Central Atlantic uh, leasing process. And as I mentioned, Carolina Long Bay was our last um, auction that we that we had. Okay, next slide, please. So New York Bite, again, that was a, another one that was a fairly recent auction. Um, and those are, are now you know, entering in that site assessment, site characterization um, process. Um, and we're also uh, beginning a programmatic EIS uh, for, uh, for those uh, areas in the New York Bite lease sale. Okay, next slide. So in the Gulf of Maine, uh, we have uh, two different uh, 
processes uh, going on. There's a, a research, lease, research lease application uh, from the state of Maine um, that's under consideration right now. Um, and then we also have the larger uh, Gulf of Maine uh, commercial lease area identification. And again, uh, that that started back in, you know, with a request for interest in 2022. And uh, we just today, and we announced it early, I think yesterday, uh, announced it, but then the, the Federal Register notice uh, published today, uh, if you're interested in seeing the, uh, the Gulf of Maine area. And then I think we have a um, task force meeting in the Gulf of Maine that's getting scheduled for early May as well. So that's that's where we are in the the state of things um, in the Atlantic. I did include a, another slide on just where you can find um, some environmental studies and white papers. Uh, there again, these are just links for you to be able to you know find where our bone funded studies are and and uh, white papers that can support our uh, NEPA assessments uh, can be found on our on our website. So I know that's a, a lot there uh, to take in. And I, are we taking just questions at the very end of all the presentations? Is that? If there's any like quick clarifying questions that any of the committee has, we can take them now. Otherwise we'll wait till uh, questions at the end of all of the presentations. I have a quick question. And I'm sorry, I don't know this, but how many of these have to go to fruition to meet the goal? Like when you're thinking about all of these out there, and then we bring in all the other, other regions, like does only three of these have to go all the way to fruition to meet the goal? How does that all worked out? I've got, we've got a chart we can send you all with that. It shows all of the, the uh, what we have in the permitting pipeline uh, on, in the Atlantic uh, and, 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 and the actual projected um, gigawatts produced by each. And I can tell you that we have about, 10 in the process right now i mean if brian said seven i it's I, it, it depends on how you define it but but right now we, i can tell you with the ones that we are moving through that we are um the ones that are that are under construction and the ones that we are are currently evaluating for nepa we think we get to about don't uh, my my math i don't want to do math in public here but uh, but but basically we get to about 19 gigawatts 20 and then we have about six eight more where we get to very, very close to 30. And we do get there before our projections are 20, before 2030. I will say that uh, again, as I said, um, we are, I mean, we are responsible for NEPA permitting. We can't presume any outcomes. And we also know that our experience shows that as these start to move from plan to reality, things change in, uh, in, in terms of this, we learn more the developers change strategies. There's some, you know, there, there may be different number of turbines than they projected, things like that. And so uh, we, yeah, that these, this is our, our best estimate based on, you know, with all those caveat caveats. So uh, again, uh, it still, we, we're still, even though we believe we get there with, with what we have in that pipeline with, with that uncertainty, you know, looking at all those other lease areas and, and such, but uh, I do have, uh, we do have a slide that I can share with the committee that, that, that speaks to that specifically. Okay, next we will move to uh, the Pacific region, hearing from Ingrid Beardron. Hi, yes, Ingrid Beardron. Ingrid Beatron. Um, let me share my slides. Um, right. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Ingrid Beatron, a marine biologist with Boehm's Pacific Region. And today I'll be giving a broad overview of the Boehm Pacific Region's general um, fisheries engagement activities. Um, but before I get started, um, I wanted to thank my colleagues also for their contributions to this presentation. And in my presentation, I'll be covering um, our current work in Oregon and California. And then I'll be talking about um, some more broad questions such as how do we engage fisheries? How do we 
who do we engage with, um, what concerns have we heard, and how are we addressing those concerns? So this slide shows BOEM's jurisdiction along the West Coast. Um, we also cover the state of Hawaii, but um, I'll be focusing on California and Oregon today. So in California, um, we currently have um, five provisional winners of the California lease areas. And um, as part of those um, leases, we have several engagement activities um, that are all listed here, but I wanted to highlight that we have um, fisheries communications plans um, in place. And so as required in the lease, um, the lessee must provide the fisheries communication plan to the lessor and commercial fishing communities for review and comment, and then host a meeting with the lessor and interested fishing communities to discuss those plans. So that's one piece of um, fisheries engagement that I wanted to highlight, um, and that will be um, applied for all the the leases, but right now, um, California is the farthest along on the West Coast. Um, next, um, I wanted to highlight that Boeing published a call for information and nominations in 2022 to assess commercial interest in and obtain public input on um, potential wind energy leasing activities in federal waters off of Oregon. And um, this slide is meant to show um, Overall, that there are multiple opportunities for public input throughout um, the BOEM offshore wind authorization process. And so this slide shows that um, specifically for Oregon, but again, it's meant to highlight that there are opportunities um, for all of our processes. And um, we're earlier in the process for Oregon than in California, but um, I wanted to highlight that as, as Brian mentioned, um, for Oregon, we've been working with NCOS, so um, with NOAA, on, um, on identifying future wind energy areas. And so um, to do this, we've been incorporating the best available science and modeling, um, and also working with NOAA, or not the National Marine Fisheries Service, and Oregon's Department of Fish and Wildlife to um, apply the best data and use the best data for these modeling exercises. and. Um, we have a commitment to provide um, draft WIAs for public comment prior to completion of area identification in Oregon. So now um, thinking more broadly about how in the Pacific region, how does BOEM um, engage with our fisheries um, constituents? And so this slide shows a number of ways that we do that. And so um, we have tribal consultations, um, data gathering and stakeholder engagement plans in collaboration with our state partners prior to the calls, um, reports on the results of the engagement, publicly available data portals, um, posting updates on our BOEM website, um, notices at key points in the leasing process, task force meetings, other public meetings, focus groups, and then um, finally coordination with the Pacific Fisheries Management Council and um, also with their ad hoc marine planning committee. So um, these are just some of the many ways that we, we engage with, with our fisheries constituents. And so um, we, so this is the, the how, and then here's the who. So who are some of the groups that we've been consulting with? And so um, these are some examples. We've, we've had meetings with commercial fish, fishermen, um, as I mentioned before, at the Pacific Fishery Management Council with recreational fisheries um, and others. And so I just wanted to give you an idea of, of these different groups we've spoken with. And um, there are several reports um, that highlight what we've learned from these engagement opportunities um, in both California and Oregon. And um, those will be, they are available and the one for Oregon will be, um, or the one, there's an addendum for California that will be available soon. And so I can provide links to those if anyone's interested. And then finally, um, you know, what is it that we've actually heard? And so these um, bullets here are examples that we've, we've um, highlighted in some of our reports. Um, I want to emphasize that these aren't, this isn't an extensive list or an exhaustive list, um, but it was, these are some of the common themes that we've heard. So um, in both California and Oregon, there's uh, broad interest in understanding the economic impacts and opportunities um, 
that will be impacted by um, potentially impacted by development of offshore winds. Um, interested in understanding the potential socioeconomic impacts to fishing activities and long-term impacts on livelihoods and communities of fishermen. Um, concerned about potential impacts um, in the long term. Concerned about BOEM's communication and engagement and suggestions on how we can improve. Um, thoughts about data or potentially missing data or inaccurate data and how we can fill those gaps. Um, concerned about accountability and um, finally thoughts about how we can make sure that um, groups follow through or people follow through with the community benefit agreements. So how is BOEM addressing these concerns? Well, as, as I mentioned before, um, we are working with um, our state partners and other partners to compile the best, um, the best available data to put into our NCOS models. Um, and we have been working with the State Departments of Wildlife and also NOAA, as well as the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission on that. Um, broadly and nationally, um, BOEM is working on developing fisheries, a fisheries mitigation plan. Um, we're requiring fisheries communication plans and the leases. Um, and then finally, um, both in the Pacific region and, and nationally, we're, we're funding studies on economic, looking at economic and port impacts. And so I've listed two of those studies here, but there are a number of others. And again, I'm always happy to provide more information on those. So um, if you have any questions now or later, um, I'm always happy to answer them and thank you for your time. Any quick questions from the committee um, for Ingrid right now? Uh, yes, Dan. Um, how far along are your fisheries mitigation plans? One question. Second question. Um, would it be possible just to send us everything you got so far on how far your studies have gone so we have an idea of where you stand? Sure. Yeah. So um, for your first question, I think that's that's more at a national um, level, the fisheries mitigation plan. So I might kick it to one of the other um, people at headquarters to, to answer that one for you. But um, and then I'm happy to provide links. I'll compile something and send it to um, Caroline with the links and have her share it out to the committee. So thank you. Great, thank you. Oh, go ahead, Steve. I'll just do it without the camera. So yes, uh, Steve Joner with the Macaw Tribe. Um, the Pacific Council has sent you uh, a number of recommendations. Most recently, uh, recommendation, recommendations for improving the uh, spatial suita suitability, suitability modeling. Have you received that? And are you uh, uh, going to respond to that uh, to the council? We have received those. Um, thank you. Yes, we've received several letters. And um, uh, we have been in touch with, um, you know, with some of the, the staff at the council. And so um, so in, in time, we will will respond. But we have received them. We have been in touch with, with the staff. So thank you. And then also, do you have any idea when you'll announce the WEAs for uh, the call areas in Oregon? I don't have specific dates for that. Um, we are working on it and, and trying to meet all of our obligations leading up to that. So I can't give you a specific date right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, now we'll move on to Mariana Steen. Um, to represent the Gulf of Mexico region, regional office. Great. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you in the room. Excellent. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mariana Steen, and I am a marine biologist and the essential fish habitat and fisheries lead within the Gulf of Mexico regional offices, Office of Environment. Um, so the, the focus of my presentation today uh, is going to be on our um, offshore wind related uh, fisheries related outreach and engagement efforts because we are uh, very early in the process. Uh, so next slide, please. So considering that offshore, uh, the offshore wind program here in the Gulf of Mexico only kicked off uh, approximately two years ago in early 2021, I thought it would be helpful to begin this presentation with a brief overview of the history of our fisheries outreach and engagement efforts in support of our region's offshore wind program. This will pro provide some context as to where we are now and how we got here. 
I'll then follow with what fisheries outreach related efforts we are currently engaged in and what we have planned for the future. Next slide, please. Before the initial request for information was published in the Federal Register in June of 2021 to gauge if competitive interest for offshore wind development in the Gulf of Mexico existed, BOEM's Gulf of Mexico office began its fisheries outreach efforts by reaching out to and presenting to regional fisheries management entities such as the Gulf of Mexico Fisheries Management Council, the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission, and various state-sponsored fishery task forces to present on the potential for offshore wind in the Gulf of Mexico. After the request for information was published and the public comment period opened, the Gulf of Mexico office created a fisheries outreach strategy, began developing an outreach database with fisheries contacts, and reaching out to individual fisheries stakeholders, including fishermen associations via email. We felt it was important to write individual emails to various points of contact, explaining that the Gulf of Mexico office was in the early stages of offshore wind development, that we were reaching out to fishery stakeholders that could potentially have space use conflicts and that our goal was to communicate early and often so concerns could be identified and possible solutions discussed. We also asked if there was interest in having a uh, bone present on the emerging Gulf of Mexico offshore wind program at future fisheries association meetings, but because of COVID, not a lot of organizations were holding in-person meetings at the time. So in addition to presenting at in-person meetings, we organized small virtual meetings with points of contact representing the various fishing sectors who were interested in participating in the offshore wind development process. Also during this time, Boom's Gulf of Mexico office was in discussion with NOAA's National Centers for Coastal Ocean Sciences, which I'll refer to as NCOS moving forward, regarding the potential for a collaborative spatial modeling partnership to site wind energy areas and lease areas in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, you know, NOAA's NCOS had used this model lean um, previously to site aquaculture areas of opportunity in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so there was already some buy-in from the fishing industry on that process. Uh, and so we did eventually move forward with uh, a collaboration. Next slide, please. By January of 2022, uh, BOEM and NOAA's NCOS began having weekly meetings to develop the spatial suitability model. Also in January of 2022, uh, our office decided to host a virtual offshore fishery summit in which four fishing sector specific outreach meetings were held. During each meeting, four presentations were given and they included uh, the following topics, uh, offshore wind leasing process, the NEPA process, the spatial suitability modeling collaboration and kind of an overview of how the model worked and frequently asked questions that fishermen often have about offshore wind. Um, questions and answers in that presentation range from technical questions about wind farms, such as the typical spacing between turbines, to providing answers to common questions related to environmental impacts. The frequently asked questions from this presentation were also used to create fisheries uh, frequently asked question handouts that are available on BOEM's uh, Gulf of Mexico activities webpage at the link shown on this slide. Each of the four sessions ended with a public comment period where concerns could be voiced and questions asked. Overall, the Fisheries Summit was a great opportunity for the fishing industry to learn more about our region's offshore wind program and to ask questions and voice concerns. In addition, the BOEM team off, uh, often um, with staff from NOAA's NCOS held several small meetings with points of contact from different fishing sectors that had potential space use conflicts with offshore wind to discuss the fishing effort data used in, uh, in the spatial suitability model and their thoughts on what data should be used, including how those data were being incorporated and considered in the model. Next slide, please. So for example, meetings with representatives from the commercial shrimp industry involve discussions surrounding what years of data to use considering changes in how that effort data has been collected over time. Their thoughts on the effort data in terms of teasing out if a vessel was actually trawling versus in transit. Uh, their thoughts on what levels of fishing effort would be considered high, moderately high, moderate, and so on. Uh, and another example, we wanted to know if the setback distances we had for the hard bottom habitat data that we had in the model were appropriate uh, for safe fishing operations. So we set up a meeting uh, with points of contact from the commercial reef fish industry. And during that meeting, we asked how they fished over hard bottoms. You know, do they drift fish? Do they anchor? Um, and then we asked them what they thought an appropriate setback distance uh, for that specific habitat layer should be to allow for safe fishing operations. So, you know, 
these meetings really allowed for a lot of transparency in the process, um, and they were important for creating buy-in for this siting process. And they allowed fishery stakeholders to be actively involved in the process and have their voices heard. Um, as an example of the success of such a meeting, I'll paraphrase an email that our office received from a point of contact representing the commercial shrimp industry shortly after the wind energy areas were modeled. I just want to say thank you to the entire uh, New Orleans BOEM team for what was a very rewarding experience for us with a very positive win-win result. I hope your approach of collaboration with NOAA's NCOS and our industry will serve as a model for the offshore wind nationwide. Next slide, please. Moving on to this year, uh, BOEM's Gulf of Mexico office has continued and will continue to present on the status of the offshore wind uh, developments at regional fishery management entity meetings. Uh, on February 24th, BOEM published a proposed sale notice for its first offshore wind lease sale in the Gulf of Mexico to occur later this year. In the PSN for the upcoming lease sale, BOEM announced it will use a multiple factor bidding system. This system will allow bidders the opportunity to utilize non-monetary factors in the form of bidding credits. BOEM is proposing to grant bidding credits to bidders that commit to at least one of two options. And one of the options is a commitment to establishing and contributing to a fisheries compensatory mitigation fund or contribute to an existing fund to mitigate potential negative impacts to commercial and recreational fisheries caused by offshore wind development. This bidding credit would allow a bidder to receive a 10% um, of its cash bid in exchange for such a commitment. And on March 7th of this year, uh, we were invited to attend and give presentations at a Fisherman Association sponsored offshore wind fisheries summit held in Galveston, Texas, uh, because two of the potential lease areas that will be included in our upcoming lease sale are located off the coast of Galveston. Um, the commercial and recreational fishing communities in Texas decided that they wanted to host a summit in which they invited speakers from BOEM, Department of Energy and private industry. Uh, BOEM staff that attended gave presentations on the status of our offshore wind program, um, and we gave a, an updated presentation on fisheries related frequently asked questions. After the presentations, all attendees participated in small roundtable discussions to discuss fishery stakeholder concerns, potential solutions, and research and monitoring needs. The information gleaned from the roundtable discussions will be used by the sponsoring fishermen's organizations to inform their public comment letters in response to the proposed sale notice. And in addition, BOEM staff that attended are using that information received from those discussions to draft recommendations to management regarding mechanisms for continued and meaningful participation of fishery stakeholders throughout the region's offshore wind development process, as well as providing a list of the primary concerns and research and monitoring priorities identified by participants. Our next steps are to continue engaging with fishery stakeholders through outreach presentations and workshops, the development of updated fisheries, uh, frequently asked questions handouts, continuing to work with NOAA's NCOS to deconflict export cable routes, planning for the submission of environmental study proposals uh, to BOEM's environmental studies program based on recommendations we've received from fishery stakeholders responding to public comments in response to the public sale notice, and lastly, holding the Gulf of Mexico's very first offshore wind lease sale. And with that, I'll take any questions if we have time. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any um, immediate quick questions from the committee? Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Could you just elaborate a little bit on the bidding credits and how exactly that works and what kind of incentives that does when it comes time to building out? Um, I Honestly, that is a, that's a little bit out of my wheelhouse. It's all draft right now and it was draft in um, the public sale notice. So, and uh, I, I work in, uh, I'm a central fish habitat biologist, and so that would be better suited for someone who's in our emerging programs who handles the offshore wind uh, program. So unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for that question, but I can get you an answer for that question. Sure. Thank you. I, well, I might be able to jump in. I, I, again, I'm not uh, the economist either, but um, so that at the at the auction, you can get a, a credit up to, I think Mariana said 10, in the Gulf of Mexico, I think it was set at like 10%. It's 10%, um, it can be it can be increased if it, if you also choose the other option, which is to support, I think, local um, industry. Yeah, so I guess then it's like up to 20 or 
something. But anyway, it's the, up to 25%, I think is. Thank you. That's, a po- <laughs> that's for the non-cash bids yeah. in the renewable energy modernization rule. And I think the comment period was extended to May 1st. So, yeah, so they oh, so the modernization rule actually upped it to, to 25. But but to, to answer your question, it's 10% uh, at the auction, you know, can be used in, in non-monetary. And that's the establishment of this mitigation fund which would be done at some you know future point after uh the the lease would be the lease would be issued um and again it, we we've I, i'm involved with this only peripherally in that how it intersects with the fisheries mitigation guidance and you know some of the um the work we've been doing there and how that's kind of evolved over time where you know we have on the the Pacific Coast um I think this might have been mentioned there's a a community benefits agreement that was part of that auction and um for the golf lease sale it went one, one step further to actually be a, a mitigation fund that could be established um as a um a non non monetary bid credit so we could probably have a whole session on that if that's if if you want to talk about fishery you know have a a, a a day or an after or a session on you know fisheries mitigation specifically, um, we can probably get into that in more detail. But there's a lot of different efforts um, on that occurring. Uh, Brian, when you say mitigation fund, at least in South Florida, that doesn't mean money goes to fishermen or anything. It means that you work on the environment or the habitat. Is that the same here? No, it could. The way that again in the Oh, sale notice for the Gulf of Mexico. I think the the prioritization is that it goes for direct compensation first, and if uh, you know that's for economic loss, so inability fit. But if if that if the amount in the fund, um, if there's some money left over, basically um, after direct compensation, then it could be used for other types of things um, like you know habitat improvement or, or something like that. I, I think your direct compensation answered my okay. question. That's where my concerns are. Thank you. One follow on from the, the chat or the Q&A online was, will this also go f- to benefit recreational um, fisheries and anglers, or is it just designed for commercial fishing industry? Speaking specifically to the proposed sale notice in the Gulf of Mexico, Mariana, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was for higher um, recreational fisheries and commercial fisheries. So those two, uh, not, not private recreational angling. Thank you. Uh, okay. Any other quick questions or we'll shift, go on to our last region. Okay. Um, Eric Taylor, um, will present, uh, from the Alaska regional office. Thank you. Um, Let's see. All right. Everyone see my screen okay? We are seeing it not in presenter mode. Just your slide. Your slide back. In. Now it's good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Eric Taylor. I'm a supervisory environmental protection specialist with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management with uh, the Alaska region. It's uh, my pleasure to speak with the National Academy of Sciences this afternoon. I thought I'd give a quick introduction to Alaska in terms of the Outer Continental Shelf planning areas that we have. We have 15 planning areas around uh, the state of Alaska. Two have active leases in them. Not for sure if you can see my cursor or not, but at the top is the Beaufort Sea planning area and there are um, Two active projects there, um, the, the British Petroleum and now Hillcore uh, North Star project um, was uh, went on production in 2001. And uh, the other project that's kind of on hold is the Hillcore Liberty project. It's been a long time running. It's uh, first development and production plan was in 1998. There's actually been three development and production plans most recently. One being submitted in 2018, but now is on hold due to a circuit court decision that occurred in 2020. Um, there are um, six active lease areas in the Beaufort Sea planning area. Then move down to the other planning area out of the 15 that has active leases. Uh, it's in the Cook Inlet in South Central Alaska. Um, there are 15 active leases there. 
uh, 14 were awarded in 2017 and the most recent in uh, 2022. As opposed to uh, the three regions that you heard from the Atlantic, Pacific and Gulf of Mexico, we do not have offshore wind facilities in the Alaska region at this time and there are no current plans at the present time. Um, one important uh, aspect I wanna make is that we are conducting a feasibility study that's currently underway, not only to look at uh, wind, but also to look at wave and tidal energy potential in Alaska. That uh, study is starting to be wrapped up and we're, we will expect to get the results from, uh, from that study in the next year. BOMA is also heavily or actively engaged in the state of Alaska's tidal energy working group. So tidal energy is probably um, the, the greatest potential for renewable energy in Alaska. This figure is from the National Renewable Energy Lab of Colorado, and um, it will give an illustration of the uh, renewable energy potential, not only for offshore wind, but for also wave and tidal. In total, there's 3,800 gigawatts. And uh, if you're like me, you had to look up a gigawatt, and actually is 1 billion watts each one. And you see that wind depicted there in green by far has the greatest potential in Alaska, no surprise, uh, particularly out on the Aleutian Islands off of St. Matthew Island. Um, of the three, offshore wind, wave, and tidal, tidal probably has the greatest potential. Um, Cook Inlet has a significant tide uh, there near Anchorage. And um, right now that is likely the uh, most probable renewable energy source that we will have in Alaska. Um, like other regions, cost, feasibility, engineering challenges um, are always have to be considered. In Alaska, the biggest challenge is proximity to major metropolitan areas, those being Anchorage and Fairbanks are the two most. So those, the distances are probably one of the primary limiting factors that uh, uh, is probably causing the, the slow start in renewable energy in Alaska. Let's move on to stipulations. You've had um, some great talks from uh, the other three regions in terms of how they are operating to protect fisheries. In Alaska, we um, have been putting in stipulations through 2016 in our lease sales and to protect fisheries operators First, they have to conduct biological surveys to determine species abundance and distribution. Um, secondly, we require operators to coordinate with affected fishing communities. Um, subsistence is extremely important in Alaska and uh, it's actually pivotal for operators to work with subsistence villages, native Alaskan peoples and tribes, um, as well as port authorities. Finally, operators are to prevent or minimize conflicts with fishing communities and gear. A couple of examples of outreach and studies and mitigation. So um, we conducted outreach of feasibility of renewable energy in uh, the Alaska Outer Continental Shelf. Rural Alaskans were concerned about the scale, cost, benefits, and the potential effects of renewable energy on commercial and subsistence fisheries. BOEM is taking a very proactive approach. Uh, working with Alaska Native peoples and rural Alaskans is extremely important. Uh, and BOEM has taken a proactive approach to ensure meaningful engagement as renewable energy is considered in the future. An example of a study is that we mapped the Cook Inlet Drift gillnet areas we did that by um, interviewing and surveying the commercial fishing industry, and then also using remote sensing. So we, re we surveyed the commercial fishing industry and their organizations on what were the important fishing areas. Uh, and that led to mitigation measures to guide both the site selection and the timing for exploration activities in uh, the Cook Inlet area. An example of mitigation to protect the drift gillnet fishery, um, we required on lease seismic survey operators 
One, they're prohibited north of Anchor Point and Cook Inlet from mid-June to mid-August, which is the primarily the own that fishery for salmon in that area. Also, the survey, the seismic survey operators were required to notify the United Cook Inlet Drift Associations of any structures, so to avoid conflicts with the, with the fishery. So some recommendations um, for the standing committee to consider relative to effective and outreach. First include social scientists to conduct the outreach and facilitate discussion among the diverse stakeholders. Social scientists have specific skills and in terms of surveying, questioning, and uh, in, indeed getting uh, diverse opinions. And sometimes people hold back from opinions providing their perspectives. But uh, one recommendation is to include those specialists. Secondly, engage community-based organizations within the proposed area. So whether it's local fishing groups, commercial fishing groups, uh, municipality governments, it's very important we have found to include these organizations. Outreach and meaningful engagement. Outreach is often used, um, and I can't emphasize enough that it has to be meaningful. And in order to be meaningful, it has to be uh, both early and often. Uh, and meetings like this, while uh, they seem to be the norm of the day, I don't think there's any substitute for sitting down over a pot of coffee in a room and, uh, and getting that dialogue started. Finally, provide a forum for stakeholders to discuss alternatives. Again, uh, in our work, going to the villages and sitting down, like as illustrated here on the left-hand picture, um, there's just no substitute for that. I think people get more comfortable. You can exchange how the weather is. And I think you, you build that trust, which is absolutely essential in order to, uh, to move forward. But there was a question I think about what is success. And uh, I think for success to occur, one has to feel that their perspectives and opinions are listened to and considered and uh, that there's trust among all alternatives and, and stakeholders. Thank you. I'd be happy to address questions or wait for the question session at the end. Go ahead, Steve. Okay. No. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. Uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, I'm Steve Joner uh, with the Macaw Tribe in Washington. Um, you're going back to slides. Uh, you can bring those back uh, on the looking at. Uh, okay, I got something blocking me. Uh, looking at the various species and so on. Is that is that it? Yes. Okay. Um, is that specific to Alaska, or uh, is that some uh, nationwide policy of all? Steve, that's a good question. Um, it is. My guess is that it is BOEM nationally. Um, I, I know we have taken it um, here in the region, but typically in the in the process in the National Environmental Policy Act process. Um, you know, understanding species distributions, abundance, trans migrations, that's pivotal to understanding the potential effects of a proposed development. So um, that sort of data collection is nationwide. Does that answer your question or? Well, I guess um, it looked like it was more comprehensive than what we've seen. I know you have your uh, suitability model, uh, but I just, because when I've asked the question about the suitability modeling, uh, things like larval distribution, uh, groundfish distribution of groundfish larvae, there wasn't an answer for it. I mean, that's just one example. Um, so I guess I would like to uh, follow up on that as if it's, uh, it seems like it's a little more comprehensive in Alaska from what I've seen on the Pacific coast. You raise a good point. I, you know, questions and concerns like 
um, natural resources um, and fish in this case um, have to be brought up early so the studies are started early to um, ensure you just don't, you're coming in at the, the ninth inning with two out. Fishering, um, fisheries in Alaska, um, no surprise to all of you around the table is extremely important from a commercial standpoint, but also from a subsistence standpoint, people's life styles, traditional, cultural, and nutritional dependency on fisheries is critical. And so um, BOEM in Alaska has has made a significant and substantive effort to engage rural Alaskans as well as the commercial fishing industry in terms of potential projects. So I just want to uh, say that we'll move smoothly right into the official time for committee question and answer. So this is an introduction or kind of get the committee to uh, chime in. And also one um, note for participants, we are going to start a poll on the, the Zoom just to get a sense of where, what everyone's background, what industry sector you're coming from and what region of the country. So that is something um, we'll be launching shortly. Um, if you could um, participate, we would greatly appreciate just to get a better sense of the online participants for this meeting. I just have one quick question. So, there's a lot of tremendous amount of effort being done in all the different regions right now. And uh, there's a lot of data being generated that could go and be used beyond just the wind farm siting. Is there any effort, coordinated effort, to create data products that could be used in the future from all these efforts? That these, you know, that there's something lasting on the data side and the science and the com combination of the data sets that you're putting together to do all this. Thanks. That's a that's a great question. Um, there, there's a lot of efforts. Right, well, first, first of all, a lot of the data that's collected is included in the construction and operations plan, I and mean, that's why the data is collected is to support that uh, construction and operations plan. But then in addition to that, there's also uh, some pre-construction surveys that are done after the COPs submitted, but before construction starts, and then post-construction um, you know, surveys that are done um, afterwards as well. And you know, there, there's reporting requirements associated with those. But I think there's a lot of discussion about, well, not just you know, the paper report product, but how do we um, you know, get that information, you know, you know, more timely than waiting for a report and then in what format, you know, what standard, you know, um, standard should be that information should be reported. So it could be aggregated across projects. Um, and that's a very active discussion that's, that's going on right now, um, you know, with BOEM and, and just even across developers and in some of these on the Atlantic, uh, some of these entities like the um, Regional Wildlife uh, Science Consortium and um, the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance. Um, you know, those are those are some entities that have kind of stepped up to try to coordinate that um, that effort so that yeah, you can get to a point at some point in the future where it's fairly easy to to aggregate some standard data that's collected across the different projects. But um, that's a work in progress. Tricia. Brian, Brian, would you oh. just elaborate on that? Answer a little bit more about some of the proprietary nature of the data that has to be submitted to BOEM and why I think a lot of the public may not be aware of the reasons why it's confidential. Sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, on the geophysical uh, data side, we do get terabytes of, of, of data um, submitted as part of the uh, construction and operations plan. But a lot of that, it's extremely expensive to collect. Uh, and, um, you know, they're, you know, potentially someone else could come and and use that for some other for, for some other project. So, a lot of that data is considered, um, you know, uh, confidential business data um, that is uh, that is retained by BOEM and not you know published on our on our website. 
Um, we do have uh, both in the renewable energy program and in the oil and gas program, there are retention policies on when that data becomes available. And matter of fact, uh, there's some great examples in the Gulf of Mexico on the oil and gas side where they've really published some really interesting maps of the seafloor um, aggregating all this data over over years. But that's a very mature program, though we're not at that point yet in the, the renewable energy side. But um, so we do have some some standards in our regulations about when all that data can be uh, can be released, at least on the geophysical data side. Now, a, a lot of the biological data, it, there doesn't seem to be as much um, you know, concern about releasing the biological data. And that's where I think a lot of the, the work is being done currently. But I think Again, there's uh, just the concern that the you know of of getting all those pieces together, getting the project uh, built, and then focus on you know how to push out that that data to to everyone. So active active uh, area of collaboration. Thanks. Thank you. So I think um, Jim had asked the question about whether or not we're building enough you know, on time um, a little while back. And there have been, you know, there have been a number of studies, including the mass decarbonization study, um, Brattle Group, that are saying that like in New England alone, we need 50 gigawatts of offshore wind and 50 gigawatts of solar to meet the net zero by 2050 goal. Um, we just saw uh, a presentation um, from some companies in the Netherlands talking about how those countries around the North Sea have set a goal for 130 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2027, which is larger than the US goal. Um, and I guess the reason that I bring that statement to the front is that when we think about kind of trying to build out offshore wind, at the pace and scale that we need to. We're not going fast enough. We're not deploying it fast enough to meet the new IPCC goals. We are not going to have in hand the data, all of the information that we need to understand impact or to understand cumulative impact as we build. We're learn we're gonna like, we have to fly the plane while we're building the plane, essentially. And so that creates for me, and I think for organizations like, like the Nature Conservancy, a lot of questions about how we're, how we're rolling it out, how we're thinking about basin scale, seascape, seascape scale impact, um, which is number one, and how we do that as the environment is literally changing because of climate change. So we're gathering data, but also how we adaptively manage and I think, and learn, you know, as we go. So how we share data, how we learn from that, how we incentivize pilot and demonstration work around restor restoration models, either within lease areas or outside of them. And some of the, some of the comments that have been made or information exchanged about, uh, I'm, I'm trying to sort through that there are, there are policies, there are policy decisions that BOEM makes about how it engages. And then there are regulatory and legal constraints. But I think it would be really helpful for this committee to understand where are we, where is BOEM actually constrained by the law versus what is a policy decision and what are the mechanisms like what are the preferred mechanisms are we looking at rule changes are we looking at statutory changes are we looking at different types of mechanisms like the auction process or um, collaboration with states in some way or the regional wildlife science collaborative and funding using you know lease sale money to fund these broader kind of scientific efforts, because I don't really have a very good sense of where the intervention points are in the process to provide advice that would be actually implementable. 
And I think that would be something, I'm not saying you answer that right here and now, because it's a big question, okay? But, and I don't expect anybody to, any one person or one agency, I think that's unfair to say has the answer there. But I think that is like what we need to start talking about because people want to contribute, but we're not quite sure how to provide advice in a way that can actually be implemented and get us to some of these endpoints that I think we all want to get to. Yeah. Thanks very much. So um, my comment kind of follows on Trisha's, um, but but segues slightly differently. So this is sort of in the in the vein of doing things in parallel when you don't necessarily have all the information. So one of the things um, from my work in Alaska that I'm familiar with is there there was uh, a comprehensive economic. Uh, a, a fund that was just that was established um, called uh, in response to the Dinkum Sands um, Arctic oil and gas leasing. It was an environmental impact fund, and it was based on a, a pretty comprehensive economic assessment of of impact of oil and gas in the Arctic. And I'm curious to know if there's you know sort of what in parallel work is being done to do an economic impact regionally and comprehensively on uh, the impact of oil and gas on the environment, much like the one that was done in, in at Dinkum Sands, and Eric may be better able to address this. Um, and then, and then uh, you know, sort of what tools may be available in order to make funds like that available moving forward in the future to help mitigate um, effects. Janet, I'll take a a stab at your question. Um, I'm not the best person, but I promise you we'll get an answer to you. Um, BOEM has been involved with looking at um, the economics of uh, oil and gas and its effect on communities. We also are looking at a current study right now on the Kenai Peninsula in terms of uh, potential development there and impacts with that tourism, um, which of course is extremely important on the Kenai Peninsula. But I, um, what I'll do is I'll reach back to my colleagues here and, uh, and provide an answer whether what studies have been done and then what studies could be currently underway. Okay, thanks, Eric. I just, I just wanna make sure that I, I was clear with my question. I'm using the oil and gas restoration fund as an example for okay. what could potentially be done with respect to offshore wind. I'm not, I'm not inquiring about oil and gas directly. Okay. So you're, you're interested to see whether there are any plans in terms of doing that economic analysis relative to wind, is that right? Correct, in the way that it was done, for example, with Dinkum Sands. All right, all right, thanks. So we'll, uh, Bill, we see your hand, we'll get to you in a second. Ron, why don't you? So my question, I guess to each region, but maybe starting with the Northeast, is the issue of connecting up to the grid. Who's who's dealing with that, and and how are those uh, problems going to be resolved? Because we already have companies running cables ashore, and a, and a lot of public uh, response to that. Um, and I have no idea the status of the modifications that have to be made to the grid to accommodate thirty gigawatts. Um, and I know the National Renewable Energy Lab is working on a report. But I don't know when that's due out. So I was just curious, what is the current status in each area? Are there gr similar grid problems in the other regions that we have in the Northeast? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a it's a great question. I mean, this is an area, you know, the closer you get to shore, the more jurisdictions you're 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 getting into. So um, you know, I, you know. Obviously, we you know when you start getting to sure, you start getting talking to inter interconnection. You know, you're getting into like FERC, you know, Army Corps, BOEM's um, primary role is diminished a little bit because we are OCS, we're the Outer Continental Shelf. Um, so we we serve as as a coordinator um, and um, an understanding what the the constraints are, especially when we're doing our environmental analyses on you know where the possible interconnections might be but um but i and we have a um transmission group that's really 
you know, working across the government to try to, um, you know, coordinate that. But um, but it's a it is a complicated process. And you know, individual talk about the Northeast. You got the um, I forget what the ISOs stand for, but um, you have the the, the regional um, uh, grid operator uh, to to coordinate with as well. So. The answer is that it's a complicated situation with a lot of different entities, including down to the local municipalities, as to, you know, where those cables go, what substations are built where, and and so forth to to handle it. So, uh, I know it's not probably a great question, other than say it's complicated, or a great answer, other than say it's complicated. Um, and I, I would like to chime in on that um, and just say that we are in the very early. Um, stages of working with NOAA's NCOS to, um, to site potential export cable corridors. And that would involve reaching out to the various states where those connection points would be. Um, and, and, I, and then I think Department of Energy kind of takes over once you get on land too. I think they kind of help out with that process a little bit as far as siting goes. Um, and, but again, very early in the process, but we we're trying to kind of get ahead of that issue. Bill, you want to ask your question or comment? Yeah, uh, yeah just give me a second. I, I, I uh, actually, I, I had a an observation I, I thought might be helpful from a, the earlier question, which which was we're generating all this information and and uh, how is it going to be coordinated or used and and. Uh, 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 one fundamental thing that I think would be helpful for the committee to know is that we have uh, an initiative, it's it's still in its early stages, that we call S Status of the Outer Continental Shelf, its acronym is SOX, uh, but the, it, it, it was really prompted by the realization that we, that we have a certain information base that we, that we, that, you know, that we sort of redo typically uh, every time there's a new EIS, some new document, you go back, you know, you go into putting the information together and put it into that document. And the thought was that the initial thought here was was that it would be good to have a uh, a, a thoughtful, comprehensive database with uh, which whose scope fundamentally is all of the dimensions of the environment under OXLA or statute. The marine, the marine, the coastal, and human environment. So it would include economic information and public fisheries information. And, and we've we, we've launched an effort to put that together. We actually have an internal website that we're developing with it. And 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 what and and we obviously will do that uh, with with many partners. Uh, our you know our science program with the environmental research we do we we. We put all of our publications into something called ESPIS, but I mean, ultimately, we'd want to make sure all of that is available in SOX and then all of the important assessment documents. And then we have a study underway now on ecosystem-based management. Uh, a, a you know, a big part of which is to, you know, see if we can have a, a good model for uh, that could be applied to the information in in, in SOX to sort of facilitate decision making you know in, including uh, uh, you know impacts on fisheries so so I just I just want folks to know we're, we haven't you know ignored the importance of of trying to bring all this together and, and socks socks is really our our unifying initiative right now. Thanks, and thank you all right. Um, first, thank you all for these presentations. They were really helpful and I appreciate your effort putting them together. Uh, a couple of the presentations mentioned something about spatial suitability modeling and then the data sets that come into it. And so I was curious about the process of evaluating those data sets. I think one even maybe mentioned that they were the best scientific information available. And so how, how you come to that determination and then the overall data sets and the modeling is there any external scientific review or independent scientific review that occurs at those various stages? Um, well, I can jump in. Yeah, I think um, that was definitely in our presentation. And so we are GIS people and um, 
worked with, like I said, the National Marine Fisheries Service and their scientists to, to you know, basically decide which data to use, and and then um, also with the um, Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission too. So there's like there are whole presentations on how the, the this data was compiled and processed and analyzed, and um, so it's kind of more than I can dive into here. But um, those and then the Oregon, um, the state, they also there's the state scientists worked with us. So you know, so there were extensive processes and and working with those organizations to um, discuss and um, determine which data to use. And then it's an ongoing process. I mean, this is something that's ongoing. It can always be improved. Um, we also did a presentation with the um, um, with NIMS to the Pacific, um, the PFMC, the Pacific Fisheries Management Council. So um, there have been lots of efforts to make sure we we're using the, you know, the right data in the best way. But it is an ongoing conversation, and we're always open to input. Yeah, and I'll just chime in that it, it was a very collaborative process. I mean, with, depending on the the data that was included, there was a a lot of data. I want to say ours had. 58 or 54, you know, different data sets and, you know, ranging from, you know, military, you know, data layers and use in the ocean space to, you know, fisheries effort data. And that's, you know, coordinating and working with NIMS and their experts. Um, uh, and Fish and Wildlife Service was very involved um, in helping to provide data. Um, so it, it wasn't done in a vacuum. Yeah. I I don't want to add, add repeat too much what it was already said, but um, so yeah, specific to the NCOS modeling process, um, you know, that is a, a an iterative process, right? So, you know, we look at what are the best available information is, incorporate that, but then go back out to the public and say, you know, this is what how the results are. Is there anything else? But I think that we, we should probably have someone from NCOS on whether or not the model itself was peer reviewed or part of some kind of NOAA peer review process. I think the model itself was, but not at every iteration. We don't re redo it um, at, you know, ask for an independent peer review at, at every um, model iteration or for every uh, project area. Um, but I, I really want to, you know, emphasize like the call for information and nominations that call is also asking the public if you have information on this area, submit it to us so we can consider it in our area identification process. And then the in-cost process is just built on top of that existing um, regulatory process that we already have. And Karen? Yeah, I, I, I was just going to, and actually this really ties to another question, the, a question you had earlier, Steve, too, about how we incorporate uh, input. Uh, and one of the things we're doing, especially we, we started this with the Gulf of Maine. I don't say we started it, but we, we're really trying to to build on it is we 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 had very early before we the the, the call for information's gone out uh, this week, but there were several pre meetings and workshops and public information sessions uh, and and meetings with specific uh, fishery interests, tribal uh, tribal nations, and others where we talked about how we incorporate that their their information. Uh, there's there's a bit of you know what's the data that goes into that and and how do we bring in not just scientific knowledge but how we bring in indigenous knowledge how we bring in um, the knowledge and experience of 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 uh, fishermen but also then how do we what, what I think the challenge is, is the models can tell you certain things but then how do you evaluate that and then how do you weight certain things I think it would definitely be worth having and costs in to talk about that um but also i think how we're trying to incorporate that and that's truly something that we're, we're trying to work into it takes a, a lot more time and it, as somebody mentioned earlier got to do it face to face a lot of times and, and bring the groups together but we're finding it has a, a bringing a lot of value into how we're making our decisions and we're trying to incorporate it very early on especially in this work in the gulf of maine and let me just interject on sort of on top of all that. There, there's long been OMB guidance on peer review for federal agencies, and uh, and BOEM uh, adheres to that. And we and we and it, it requires judgments about whether assessments are highly influential, influential, or are not in those categories. Uh, the one that we've judged on air quality that 
is to be highly influential. We went to the National Academy for a consensus report, a peer review report. Uh, and and we, we have a fairly detailed, I won't I won't go through it now, process for making sure that we have uh, uh, external review and notice of that and so forth. And it's you know it's it's been an issue that's been of great concern for the COSA standing committee and and you know we'd be happy to uh, uh, put together an explanation of that and and address the, that issue with you going forward. Yeah, all of these questions and comments have kind of. <laughs> I guess I, my my question is perhaps somewhat been addressed, but not totally. And I guess I'm wondering in terms of all of the data that's coming together, like, is there an overarching like source repository for all this data? Like these data, like, so when you, like the Marine Cadaster, for example, exists and it seems like that has some data and they're talking about socks and creating this new thing specifically for the off, for the continental shelf. It feels like I, and, and maybe I'm not, maybe I'm missing the forest for the trees a little bit here, but it seems like there's not one location for all of this information that then I understand that there are bits and pieces that, you know, kind of can't be put in there. Like when you think about the Gulf of Mexico and talking with um, shrimp trawlers about where they're going, you know, there's, there's, there's pieces that are always going to be local specific, but like, I don't know, for example, the, you know, where seagrass exists, you know, kelp forests, things like that, where, you know, there's all of these different pieces. And I know NOAA has, for example, tons of these various repositories and they exist across all kinds of different entities. And so I guess I'm just curious about that in large part because one of the one of the pieces of feedback I've heard particularly for the West Coast process has been that um, there's been a need for a lot of analysis and a lot of analysis has been funded to happen but because the process is moving so quickly there's not been enough time to assemble all of the necessary, data layers in order to do the analysis before things are like off and running. And so basically it's almost like, you know, even a, even a, you know, a really basic piece of that can be, can be missing. And so as I've been thinking about this and, you know, kind of where our recommendations might come in in that um, part of what I've been thinking about is, you know, how to improve that process going forward for some of the other regions that are quite a bit further behind. So that's kind of where my uh, question is, is stemming from in particular. I can lead lead off a response, and it, it, I, I think you touched upon it when you said it depend. It really depends on what data you're talking about, what data set you're talking about. I, Bill or, or Rodney uh, is going to be talking. I think Rodney Cluck will be talking about the Environmental Studies Program tomorrow. Um, but you know, so yeah, federally funded stuff. It's very clear. You know, we have processes for federally funded uh, work. Um, you know, to get that out, push it out as soon as the the results come in. We you know, use different data portals, including the cadaster re regional data portals that um, have been stood up, I know, on the Atlantic and um, and I think the East, the West Coast as well. Um, but then it gets complicated when you start getting into, you know, developer, you know, studies and where are those ultimately end up um, and how they're aggregated. You know, right now we have all the construction and operations plans and a, lots of appendices on our website for each individual project. Um, you know, is that, you know, the best you know, repository in the end. I know we've been in, you know, touch with the National Centers for Environmental Information and CEI at NOAA uh, on potentially housing some other types of, of raw data that might be associated with some of these projects. But again, that's part of that larger conversation. So it really does depend on, you know, exactly what data you're talking about as to what the time um, retention will be on, you know, whether it's a paper report or if it's the raw data uh, and, and how soon that becomes available. Yeah, and just uh, actually, let me just add, I, I really appreciate the, the question that you're asking. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I'm sure, frustrating to the public in many ways, how hard it is to get hold of everything that's relevant. But but again, we, we, are, we are working hard to try to address that. The SOX initiative is, I mean, it's a good example where uh, if it's successful, we'll be able to. Uh, 
uh, a much better, simpler way to find. I am. We haven't we haven't invested anything yet in the you know the new the new Bing chat GPT and so forth, but but uh, uh, but we're cognizant that there's you know that if we can put all this together, it, it, life could be much easier for people that want to get answers. And I, I did know just today that for the first time that that using Bing we could that you can get some specific answers out of our ESPA system, which had been. Uh, because of government requirements, uh, 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 difficult, you know, to, more difficult to get information from. So it's a great question. We are working on it. We could we could definitely talk more about it going forward. Uh, I just want to sort of follow up a little bit. I mean, I mean it seems like this question is as at the heart of how you do cumulative impact analysis. I mean, you're going to need this data from the individual projects in a central place where you then can do the, the science to understand the cumulative impacts. So it doesn't, it's hard for me to disentangle those two things. And I haven't heard you guys think, talk about it in that context, you know, to do these kind that kind of science, you're gonna have to be sharing this, this data is gonna have to be shared and in, in a format that could be utilized to do that, not in, you know, appendices of PDFs. Um, so maybe that's what SOX is all about, and maybe that's something we could elaborate or have a further discussion at another meeting. Uh, but those two things, things seem very related to me. I, I think they are related. And uh, I think it's a great issue for discussion uh, with, with this committee. And it's one we've been having with the COSA committee. Uh, I'd be happy to help and maybe help uh, you know, organize our staff to do that. Ingrid, did you want to comment on that? I did. I just wanted to jump in and say that um, in the Pacific region, we do have um, two publicly available portals. We've been using the um, Oregon Offshore Wind Mapping Tool, um, or ORO -O -O -R -O Wind Map, and then the Data Basin. So those are publicly available, and um, they've been in collaboration with our um, state partners. I was going to just add a, a, a bit of information and, and Brian or, or Bill, you might, you might be interesting to tell the committee and, and, and the audience just the transition that's happened just in the last few years of where we've gone from delivering PDFs to online portals to GIS based cloud systems, you know, and, and, and the, the evolution that is happening from industry side of how we face the challenge of getting you terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data. You know, we, we, we regularly send hard drive upon hard drive upon hard drive uh, to, to, to Bohm. And, and we've been looking at ways to streamline that data transfer that everyone can see, see it all in, in the cloud, so. Yeah, so I mean, so there's a lot of, Again, there's a lot of interesting pieces and strings. And it, it, again, stress really, it's until you actually start getting into what data we're talking about, it's really hard to grasp, uh, you know, the the totality and, and what it is that we're, we're, we're trying to accomplish. But on the geophysical data side, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, yeah, I think even when I started, there was still like a lot of paper <laughs> um, submitted. Uh, and that's now really evolved to uh, online portals and, and data viewers so that our, our federal partners can access the data live with us. And we can look at the data, you know, together and say, okay, yeah, this is what we're, we're seeing here. You know, this is how we're interpreting this or, or, oh, we have a concern with this area. And this is the layer that, you know, expresses that concern. So we do have, the, the tools are constantly evolving, you know, even if it's just on the, 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 you know, cooperating agency federal side that's currently seeing it. I, um, you know, again, I think there will there will be a point where that is uh, pushed into the the public domain um, at a, at a later time. Um, but as far as even as the, you know, I think what well, your questions were about, um, you know, post construction plans. Um, I mean, a good example is is Block Island Wind Farm, where you know there was I think five years of studies, and there were, you know, uh, you know, 
reports uh, that were part of that, you know, five years of uh, fisheries monitoring that that went on. Um, but then, you know, then they peer reviewed it. Then they actually published it at the end of the five years. Yeah, we did have to wait, you know, a, a while for that to be out. But, um, you know, that's the that's the process. And, you know, even for, um, you know, individual contractors that are doing it, they they do want to publish on that in the end. And if you publish all your data, the science program has to do with this a lot, of, you know, being able to publish on your own data is very important to a lot of these researchers that we partner with, whether it's academia or even, you know, private industry. So there's, there's challenges to all of it. We want to get the data out, uh, you know, as, as quickly as possible, recognizing, you know, there's a lot of different pieces that play onto what level of detail, uh, what format it's published in and how to, um, you know, ensure that again, the public is eventually seeing everything that informs our decisions, but we do see it as a, as a feedback loop. Um, every, every report we get, I'm looking at it, It's like, is this something we need to bring into the next EIS? Um, and you know, we do, but, um, I know from the public side, you're not necessarily always seeing that, uh, as well, but it's, it's an ongoing conversation. Yeah, let me just uh, add to what the, the good stuff that Brian just said, which is, you know, we're a, uh, we're a federal agency. We have a duty to be as public as we can be. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are certain uh, restrictions for proprietary information, for example, but, but, but ultimately, uh, uh, you know, we, we desire to make the information public. I think it I mean, it, it kind of relates to the, uh, what Karen Baker said early on in this meeting that we have uh, a whole range of uh, of interests uh, uh, that are care about what we do, and we want to make sure uh, we are as open as possible. And and I'm not saying SOX is the solution to everything, but it's we're working with NOAA on it too. But it's the the basic idea is to use all these advances, you know, including the Kind of mind-blowing recent advances with with AI on chat and Bing and so forth to uh, you know take advantage of that and and link as well as we can into all this information and make it open. Hey, um, <clears throat> so I want I want to make an observation here. If I could, um, you know, and you've been around a long time, like Captain Dan and myself, you, you, you think you've seen everything, but I honestly have never seen anything quite like this process. And, you know, as you're making your presentations, I really believe there's a disconnect between what you, what Bowen believes they're doing and what, what the, I'll just say the, the, the fishing interests are, are, are receiving and what 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 they believe are happening and you know a good uh, indication of that is the are uh, the number of letters the Pacific Council has has sent to you, which are basically saying this is moving too fast. I appreciate Sarah saying that. We're talking about a very large scale and permanent transition to a new form of electrical energy here and. This is a, a massive development that uh, will have you know, very severe consequences if it's not done properly. So I, I really think, you know, what, what I saw from Alaska, you know, I can only say I, I, wish, I wish I could have seen that happening on the West Coast. And I, I think the outreach was not what it should have been. And so I, I guess the message is, please slow down and please do this the right way. And I believe that you will find that folks in the fishing industry and the council and the tribes and others you know, will be willing to partner with you on this if it's true and open. But again, I've never seen anything like this where just the number of letters the Pacific Council has sent uh, say that this this is just not working. It's just moving too fast. 
and uh, it, you need to uh, kind of re revisit, redo. Can I, can I speak to that for just a moment? And 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 I don't want to dispute it, or or or, or I, I, I it's it's something we hear, and 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 and, and we consider all the time. We also hear what we heard from Tricia earlier uh, about the, the rate of climate change and the need to move faster. And I can tell you, I've been in public meetings where two people sitting next to each other are bidding me to move faster while also, and then another one saying, slow the pace down. And I think if you get to the crux of maybe even some of our issues, and maybe this isn't for this committee to look at, but I think that's one of our biggest challenges is we, we you know, why do we have an offshore wind industry? Why are we, is we we do believe that there's the climate change is real, and that there are there are impacts that we need to be that 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 we need clean energy to address. Um, there, I'm a big. Uh, if you know my uh, background, uh, I we didn't talk about that too much, but I'm very passionate about sustainability and 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 where you find those nexus and all of those where we can all thrive in terms of environment economic and 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 society and so look we're looking for those opportunities of course and we, we're balancing all of those interests i think that that is though a, a challenge in terms of it, it diff, balancing also those different perspectives of how quickly we should be moving forward in this arena uh, and i think that that's i, I i'm not i'm not making a uh, or disputing or or i, I I'm, I'm definitely validating the comment but i think it's something that is the crux of uh Many of the challenges we face with this is is the rate of speed of that how do we address this as we move forward and how do we do what we can with certainty that we are that we are uh, addressing all of those concerns. Thanks. So I mean something that that has struck me as we're talking about data in in particular is that we're talking about it on the so on the time horizon that we're talking about it thanks dan um is all like the the data that we have in the portals the data that we're inputting into ncos is being used for wind energy area identification it's being used to identify the lease areas and to avoid critical habitat essential habitat to the extent we have data that helps us do that but that data is always is not always the best it might be old in some circumstances so they are using whatever is best available but it's boehm that not they boehm is using what's best available but um it's not always the best data it's not the most recent data i think the example we saw or that is familiar to me at the nature conservancy is the central atlantic planning area where we know that we have deep sea corals, but we don't have mapping to know exactly where all those deep sea corals are. And in a lot of those instances, we're relying on, unlike in other countries in the world, we're asking the developers to do that site characterization to provide us with data that we don't have or can't afford to get. So the question is, and we keep coming back to this, but how do you use that data that you're getting after a lease area? has been assigned to inform decision making to change decisions if you have to as you go forward and i think that feeds back for me into this broader adaptive management question and to a lot of the comments that we're having just about nipa is not like really well suited as an implementing instrument to do this so can we be is there flexibility can we be creative what are the limitations on boehm to to consider other mechanisms that allow us to get at some of the questions and concerns that people have about cumulative impact and what happens operationally after we learn like that this didn't work or that this is or that this not just bad stuff but that this is really great right like we're enhancing biomass and all this other stuff how do we you know how do we build that into the decision making 
framework or the regulatory framework, or don't we? I don't, I just don't know the answer to that question, but. I'm smiling as you're, you're talking because you're talking my language in a lot of ways. And that I think NEPA gives us a certain, you know, we, we have a requirement, but, but we've, we've started having a number of conversations, even just recently, as we're talking to stakeholders about it's, it's broader than the NEPA process in terms of bringing in input and bringing in. And, and I think some of the things we're talking about, especially in terms of what I was just talk, discussing with Gulf of Maine is that's not that that's getting even ahead of us starting, you know, really early in terms of the, in that area identification of where we can imply that. But I agree with you, Tricia, and I think that's a great discussion of where are, where can we be more innovative? Where can we be adapting? I think that we are, it's hard when we talk about this in the aggregate, but as Brian said, we, we, every thing we, we, we do, we go, how do we apply this to the next place? How do we apply this? What are we going to learn from the ones that are, that are in construction right now? And to your point, I, my biggest fear is also that there's the benefits. We're talking a lot about the risks and I, and I think that they're, I, I, those are real and we, we, are, we, we don't take them lightly, but I also think that there are habitat benefits and other things that we should, but we can't yet incorporate into our, into Wayne in some of these analysis. Yeah. So I think it's a great point about within the process itself, how you can learn the future, but I actually also think that there's this, thank you. Um, this data could be used, for example, in stock assessments. Right, the better mapping of the habitat actually could be very valuable to mitigate some of the potential, you know, uncertainties in the science about how we're setting stock assessments. So it's not just within the self of the wind farm, but there's all this data being generated that could help you address some of the other issues, right? If you could give better data to NOAA to help them with their stock assessments, that might go a really long way for them to understand what the impact will be. Uh, on the stocks itself, not necessarily the fishermen, but the stocks itself. So I think there's that's what I was also getting at. Like it's it's not just in the wind farm cycle uh, how to use the data you're collecting, but how that could help mitigate and and help the other uh, issues that you have. We have a kind of a whole strategy around that too <laughs> that uh, that we're that we're working on. Um, it, it, it's definitely an active area of, of conversation about how. Um, you know, different information streams from, you know, offshore wind could, um, you know, feed into stock assessments. I think it's a lot of times it's not gathered for that specific purpose. Um, and so there's just a lot of conversation of, well, can it? And then if so, how? Uh, but there's, you know, again, it's just an area of of active, active conversation um, that we're having with, at least, I can at least speak on the Atlantic with the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Down this line, I've been speaking with or yesterday and today with some of our committee members here, and uh, it's all great and good, but if you can't finance it, if you can't find the money, and we're trying to cut $1.5 trillion out of the budget right now, it's being negotiated today, uh, and you say, well, we need X amount of dollars to look at the wind farm we put in to see what its value was or what its harm was, but we won't give you any money to do it. If we don't build this into the leasing, like on the 10% or the 25% credit you're getting, or we don't charge the end users, which would be, and I hate to say this, but the customer, you know, the people who are buying and using that energy to raise the funds that our elected officials will not do. And I guarantee you, they're not going to do it. They're trying to cut. So innovatively, we need to look as this committee and I know you guys can't do it because you work for them, but we don't. And we got to come up with a way to finance this because it's not going to come from the government. All right. And I, the reason I waited was I want to hear what was said here by, by, by you guys. Okay. Think about that for tomorrow. Think about that. We have to come up a way to finance this because without the money, we'll never know what happened, where we went right or where we went wrong. We will know what went wrong. <laughs> we, if there is a positive thing, we may or may not recognize it or understand it. 
But if we have a disaster, it is going to be obvious. And that is the whole issue in cumulative impacts. And, and the cumulative impacts are the scariest thing that has anything to do with trying to solve a environmental problem of climate change and reducing CO2 by installing thousands of inefficient uh, wind turbines that when the wind stops, it stops pretty much everywhere. And so the lights go out unless you have a backup system. And if you're going to do that, then you might as well run on the primary system and not use the um, wind turbines as the primary because you, all you have to do is go to Australia and read what happened down there. And, and they recognize that they made a terrible mistake. Now, this is all uh, land-based wind turbines, but its effect was they shut down Sydney, Australia all the time when the wind fell out quickly, even though they had enough gas-powered powered far, um, plants, far, uh, generating plants, to carry the load, but they couldn't get it online fast enough as the wind dropped out that all of a sudden they kicked all the transformers and shut the whole city down. And we are looking at doing it wrong and we will be able to see that clearly. There's, actually, I, I, I agree with a lot of what you just said, but unfortunately it sort of falls beyond the scope of what we are, but it's really important questions to ask about wind, its reliability, how it integrates into the the electricity grid, et cetera. Those are all, I think, critically important questions, but we are wind and fisheries. So we're <laughs> stuck with conditional that we're doing wind. How can we do it in a way that uh, benefits maybe even fisheries or at least has the lowest potential impact on them? So I just want to, we're, I'm going to call you a second run, but we're supposed to wrap up around five just to keep us on schedule. So a quick question to Brian, but uh, do you have the ability to require the monitoring programs to be able to provide information for stock assessment? I mean, right now, it seems you let each developer set up its own system. So one guy goes with a gill net, another guy goes with a beam trawl. Uh, they're not using tools that are currently being used for stock assessment, like the NIMRAP trawl or a drop camera and things like that? So the, the, the purpose of the monitoring programs that are part of the offshore wind is to monitor the potential impacts of that particular project. And a lot of the, the stock assessment type work is done at like a much different scale um, than would be done to, you know, monitor the, an effect of a, of a particular project. Again, we do have a lot of conversations with um, you know, National Marine Fisheries Service, like, well, if you're going to do a, a beam trawl, if you could collect this, this, and this, it could, we're not, we're not to the even point of saying it will, but it, maybe it could feed into a stock assessment pro process. Um, so I think those those types of conversations have occurred where it's like well it it's not the goal of offshore wind monitoring to to do stock assessments but the data could be collected in a way that again could um be beneficial to to NIMS for stock assessments in the future but again that that is still being worked out at I me mean, i think you're very intimately familiar with how difficult it is to get industry based data into stock assessments and that's the fishing industry itself. So imagine wind development, you know, collected data entering in stock assessments. There's there's challenges with that. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll stop there. <laughs> I, I just, I just uh, like the Orsted site uh, where uh, we have a contract. We use the Habcam, and the Habcam is a tool that's used for a scallop stock assessment. The data from the survey from the Orsted site went into the stock assessment. It seems to me there's other tools besides the HADCAM, the drop camera, 
I mean, that's for benthic organisms, but nimraptrol is actually, you don't have the ability to, to require the developers to do that, right? They, it's up to them. I mean, you, cer certainly first and foremost, it's to monitor shifts. But in reality, mm -hmm. if you're only monitoring that one wind farm with a little control area, um, you're never gonna be able to identify uh, you know, a cause and effect without having the broader picture. So it it's just, hopefully the other regions will get, get learn from our mistakes in the Northeast. But the question is, can we rectify this in time? I, I think we, we, we generally try not to be prescriptive. We do offer guidance. And I think, uh, you know, the NEMAP trawl or, or other standard standards are included in the guidance, but we, we're generally not prescriptive in that say you shall use this trawl because there, maybe there's only one vendor for that trawl and they're not able to competitively let it um anyway there's, there's or, or it might not be available for them to meet their needs so there's a lot of ways that boehm does things in that they're, they're we have a guidance that we have goals to meet and they get to present propose to us how they are going to achieve that I, let me just say I, th I, I i think it would be very useful to hear more from the committee though on the, the, the basic question you're raising and uh you know our our, our challenge is our our mandate is to have mitigation measures that protect protect the environment which is defined broadly under oxla and uh you know we're we're in the sort of the middle of a lot of thinking about uh uh whether there you know how could we do deploy a system that that would you know help answer bigger questions you know that not just limited to lease and and uh we're still talking about it we don't really have anything i think concrete to bring up right now but but it, it would be very helpful to have feedback using up others you want to hold you sure Sure. And then I'll ask if you guys have anything you'd like to sort of end with. So I, rather than put you on the spot now, you've got a second or two to think about it. So I, well, I'll, I'll paraphrase the expression. I'm, I'm from the tribes and I'm here to help. So seriously, you know, the tribes are the senior partner in, in fisheries and ocean management and, you know, watching this process unfold talking about the urgency and the time, because things weren't done sufficiently and adequately, you've lost time. And so there are a lot of questions that haven't been addressed and I'll just put one out there. We don't know what impacts, could, climate impacts could occur from offshore wind. You start, you change the dynamic of the ocean, what's gonna happen? I mean, that's, it's kind of a scary thought to me as somebody who's spent the vast majority of their life on the ocean. So um, anyway, hopefully we do that here in the committee. That was not a simple question. I think, I think my, as we're wrapping the, having this discussion, I think I was, you know, appreciating the difficulty of the charge we gave you in our statement of task. Um, I felt like we, you know, op operated almost like a public, a regular public meeting, like I've, you know, we've, we've had before in the range of uh, thoughts and, you know, opinions, all which are, are, are very, uh, you know, are completely valid. And, and that is, I think, part of the reason why we convene this committee is like, help us form this into a direction because we, we are, I think, pulled into so many different directions over this is the priority let's focus on this let's focus on this and we can't do everything all at once so if if we could get you know just some nods around the table around like oh that might be a good idea that that kind of direction is extremely uh valuable for for us to uh you know to to take forward to consider and and how we're, we're we're doing things so uh definitely appreciate the challenge of our, ta our statement of task and um, look forward to working with you, Karen. <laughs>
I can't say it much better than Brian and or any better than Brian. So I won't I won't take up too much time other than to say thank you and say you know we're we're having a great discussion here and and hitting on things. Our our role isn't really to defend all we're doing other than help explain so that we can give you the information. But you're hitting upon things we talk about around the table all the time. And so we're um, you know we're this is why we came to to this this committee and 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 why we really uh welcome your input as as this goes forward and happy to continue to answer questions and provide whatever information we can so i just on just a follow-up on that so i really appreciated earlier how you talked about you didn't want to be prescriptive in terms of sort of trying to dictate where the committee went but i do feel like it would be very valuable if we do hit some questions on topics that you guys have been thinking about and are, you know, still haven't had clarity to hear that back because that could be then, a, you know, the next meeting topic, for example. So we could be most beneficial to you. So getting that feedback, like when we do hit topics that you've had internal discussions, nothing's resolved and there could be some insight we could bring, that would be also helpful. And we wouldn't view that as being prescriptive. We view that as being sort of just a partner and, uh, and trying to be most useful for you. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, no, nope. Carolyn has. Thank you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, I wanted to thank all of our presenters today um, for joining us. Um, it, it definitely was uh, very informative and, and um, as already mentioned, a lot of good dialogue going around the table. Um, also really want to appreciate or really want to thank the participants. Um, I, I know we didn't get to all of the questions in the chat uh, or the Q&A. Um, as a committee, we will get a report out of all of the, the Zoom questions and plan to um, try to address them tomorrow if we, we can in open session. Um, if not, we will um, reach back out to uh, participants um, uh, after the, the meeting to address any uh, questions that we can't get to. So um, you, your questions are being seen and, and heard. Um, apologize we couldn't get to more questions from the uh, online participants today. And with that, this closes our meeting unless Jim, you want the final word. All right, thank you everybody. Um, and we will start, uh, the open session will start at 2 p.m. tomorrow. Thank you.